Hello again, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of the Jim Cornette Experience here where we don't have a fucking clue what we're going to talk about until we get to it today. It's potpourri today. Everything from pro wrestling to oil mines in Texas. And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. When you think of great podcasting, you think of this man last. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again at last. Uh, oh, very good. Very good. I've just gotten a late update right before we went on the air that the Monroe brothers have not been able to figure out how to change a light bulb. Something broke off and went down in the thing on the in the socket on the column lights at the gate, and they don't want to get electrocuted, but we don't know how to turn those things off because there is no switch. This could be changing a light bulb could lead to a visit from an electrician here at the castle. <sighs> What's going on with you this week? Not too much. A- another wonderful week. Enjoying life. Everything is good. Good, good. How's how's wife and kids? You know, I'm gonna Mike Mills has started saying something to me that apparently he stole from Buddy Landell and uses sometimes in business meetings, which cracks me up. So I'll say it okay. here. Okay. I'm here to be blessed and be a blessing. <laughs> that's that's when when good buddy had taken over the the earthly vessel that was buddy landell good buddy was here to bless and be blessed and bad buddy was if it don't snow we can't go who do you think was better with the finding religion gimmick buddy or jake because you can say whatever you want about jake when he committed to that on tv at least he was pretty good he was pretty convincing well what well, now do you mean the gimmick or actually doing it because when when a couple of times there when when Buddy did it, he actually did it, whereas, I mean, you can't believe Jake Roberts if his tongue was notarized. It was a gimmick for television, but he did, he, if Jake did the religious gimmick on television better than Buddy ever did, because Buddy really didn't ever do it on television that much. Yeah, I don't believe Jake ever really found religion at all. Buddy, I think, actually I tried. think Jake is the one who lost it originally. <laughs> for everybody, hid it from everybody. So, <laughs> anyway, I've about lost my religion on action figures. How's that for a transition? Not bad. Folks, all last weekend, we were a bit verklempt, somewhat bum-fuzzled. Uh, we, we didn't exactly know what was going on. And I don't, a lot of people are now saying, how's that different from any other week? But, uh, after a, a few days of intensive inventorying, I've sorted through this mess that was the action figure sale last weekend at jimcornet.com. And I do have an update for those of you with a financial interest in this. And that is that first of all, if you ordered from jimcornette.com before the action figures went on sale Friday, March 26th, a week ago today as we speak. That stuff, by the time you hear this, uh, what is it, Saturday, April 3rd now that th this is going to air, Brian, last? That is correct. That is correct. Then your stuff is in the mail, except for a few people who ordered Tuesday night at the Gardens. I've been assured by Amazon that those books will be in uh, at the first of this week. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we got everything all inventoried. A lot of people were so verklempt and, and trepidatious and, and nervous about getting in and rushing that they, they sent me way too much money. They ordered multiple things when they only wanted one thing. And we, 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 some of those people caught that and notified me other people we caught for them. And there are still a couple of people that I've yet to contact that I'm going to be doing this weekend to say, Hey, do you really want two, two packs? all to 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 Dennis um so anyway uh but we have everything settled down everything inventoried and the official tally we sold just under remember I said I'm going to have 1500 of each figure 3000 total figures available will they last till Christmas the answer is going to be apparently no we sold just under 2000 of the 3000 figures in 72 hours Plus, a lot of folks uh, ordered other items to go along in their in their cart, as the kids say as well. So, 
The good news is there will be action figures left to go back on sale again when we open the store back up after we fill all these orders. The bad news is that's not going to be for a while, kids. Uh, the store is going to be closed till at least mid-May. Uh, my entire garage is now full of action figures. I have everything in stock and ready to send out. All the other orders have been sent out. Some people, Brian, you this surprised me, actually. Just, I guess, like a an innocent bystander stumbling onto a car crash. Some people just got on the website and ordered normal stuff, like an autographed picture, a T-shirt, and didn't realize they were in the crush of this chaos. So I feel it only fair that for like those 80 or 90 people over that course of time that didn't get involved in this action figure mess and had nothing to do with it, I'm going to be filling their stuff first. That stuff will probably go out on Wednesday morning or so. Uh, but otherwise... I've got to take off Monday and Tuesday for Stacy's surgery, and thank you, everybody, who's uh, wished her well and sent emails or et cetera, and it's uh, supposedly a routine thing and just involves being sore and not being able to pick up anything even as big as our dog for the next two or three months. But uh, I've got to take Monday and Tuesday off for Stacy's surgery, and then the figures will begin shipping by the end of the week, and they will continue <laughs> shipping. Every freaking day that I am able to get to the post office and then return and begin again until we've muddled through this. And for you international folks, you know the drill. It's going to take a while to get there, but it's going to take a while for me to get those out. But there must be, I get, you know, we've got a big international listenership. There must be a 25% of these orders were from across the pond, and that involves customs forms and Poor Bree is going to type her fingers to the bone. You know what she's going to have then, don't you? Bony fingers. Bony fingers. That's exactly right. Anyway, thank you, folks. I am the, uh, I am in it, it, it forever in your debt for going in debt to purchase my action figures. Anyway, what do you got to talk about? Uh, this is your show. That's what you always well, say to me on the drive through This that, is your yeah, Now show. you're using my own material against me. Yeah. We're going to talk about a few fun things today. We have a follow-up on, we did some old-time classic wrestling inside business, business, business talk on the drive through about uh, Smoky Mountain and ECW and the comparisons. And I dug some other stuff up uh, from Smoky Mountain from my records people might be interested in today. And we have a new feature on the program today, folks. Last clips. These are the clips that Brian Last sends me of things happening around the world of professional wrestling that I may be tempted to comment on. And I call them last clips because normally, under most circumstances, they are the last fucking clips that I'd like to watch in the whole world. But we'll talk about that today, too. Did you see? They threw a wrestler, I, I use those air quote things, They a wrestler in the United Kingdom in jail for fucking kicking his fucking opponent in the face. Apparently with malice aforethought. I saw something about that. I didn't really follow it too closely because I had I, no idea who anyone was there. Well, that's part of the problem, but I read it. It speaks to a greater issue, but I read it because I, I saw the picture of this fucking guy. His face looked like a deflated basketball. I mean, it, it wasn't just a potato. It fucked up, apparently, his cheekbones, his eye sockets, his nose, either broken or cracked or whatever caved in front of his face in. He he looked like a, a, a sad motherfucker in a hospital bed, wrapped up like the invisible man. The only thing you could see was bruises and swelling. And so I had to see, well, what, precipitated this right what was the fucking deal behind this apparently the guy the 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 face kicker was a not only a pro wrestler air quotes but also this guy's trainer and a trainer air quotes at a school somewhere and they showed a picture of him and you've never you don't have any clue who this fucking clown is except that he does look athletically in shape right and then you see a picture of the, that was the kicker. You see a picture of the kicky, 
before under normal circumstances this was not the best looking fucking guy on the planet but he he looked i mean my god like a pale fishy white kind of hair thinning at a young age buggy whipped arm just a guy that would be working at a store and this guy was in wrestling school and apparently the story was that there was a last minute, somebody didn't show up is what I was reading between the lines in the terminology they weren't using in, in the newspaper. Somebody didn't show up and, and this guy, <laughs> the, the kicker said, Hey, I'll, you work with me to the trainee, the kicky. So apparently the established pro, the trainer had a bad back or something was sore or whatever. And I guess they did the spot that all the marks do these days in the strong style matches where they, the guy's sitting there and the other guy just comes up and kicks him in the back and a kidney, just as hard as humanly possible, which for this poor guy, uh, the fucking guy that got his face kicked in him doing the kick and it probably wasn't that hard to begin with, but that's, it's a stupid spot on the surface of it. And the fucking guy got hot and <laughs> The poor guy that got his face kicked in, his testimony was, and then he hissed at me, receipt. And he, <laughs> like, that's a thing you that has ever been done that you would ever do to warn the fucking guy. And see, this this is what speaks to the bigger <laughs> issue. Which We'll go ahead and say it now, is that none of these people belong in a fucking wrestling ring. The trainer or the trainee, because the trainer obviously is a guy who has trained himself by reading the internet or being trained by another mark that read the internet that yeah that's what they call it's a receipt you say receipt you don't call a receipt you just go hey god damn it lighten up that's what a fucking receipt is you potato somebody and they go lighten up but you anyway the guy is receipt he hissed, he hissed it. He hissed it. That Receipt. was the quote. That was the quote. He hissed <laughs> receipts. And then the guy, the 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 kicky is sitting there waiting to get kicked in the back. He said, when instead the guy just came and football kicked him full force right in the face. Boom. And then I guess whoever else was playing in the in the in the sketch continued the match around this guy while he's bleeding and fucking agonizing and everything and. Then his face blew up like a goddamn rotten watermelon in a hot sun. And then, you know, then they, he got mad and called the cops. And, and so they sent this guy to jail for almost two years for grievous bodily harm. I love it. We, even the charges over there sound so much more important and have such gravitas to them. Over here, we got assault and battery. Over there, it's grievous bodily harm. But anyway, so that that'll here's the problem. If he can learn how to slap his leg, AEW will give him a job when he gets out of prison. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking, if you put that guy in the AEW environment, the way they're so goddamn reckless and just throw this shit everywhere with little regard for anything, how would you be able to prosecute somebody in that environment? It's like watching a fucking barrel full of monkeys fucking footballs. It's just everywhere. Anyway, so that guy, he, he, by the way, he has been suitably chastened and will not be hissing receipt anymore. <laughs> but speaking of leg slapping, I understand that two of the modern era's biggest superstars, one, and I guess an obvious proponent of leg slapping at the right time, although he didn't get ridiculous with it and another not a proponent of leg slapping have weighed in on the leg slapping controversy yeah actually i just uh i'm assuming you're referring to this thing i just read put together in the observer i saw an article in the new york post the other day which was an interview with sean michaels well that's what you said that before we went on the air and that's what popped me because i didn't think that today would be the day i would hear somebody say there was a quote from sean michaels in the new york post yeah, apparently there was about mostly NXT because he is so involved behind the scenes with NXT. But Dave combined this in the Observer with another quote, which I had not read from Bret Hart. And the topic is leg slapping, which, of course, as we know, 
Just recently, we heard a sign put up at gorilla position. Do not slap your legs. I don't know if that's exact <laughs> verbiage they use there, but a edict from or an edict from Vince McMahon not to slap your legs. And we what don't. about if it's an outdoor show and there's mosquitoes? Ooh, that'd be a good uh, workaround for it. <laughs> yeah. No oh, shit, Vince. They're eating me up. <laughs> if somebody tried to get away with that, he'd probably give him a, a bonus just for being a fucking. Why is that? Go ahead. So from the New York Post, here was the quote from Shawn Michaels. The question was, as someone who is known for super kicks, what's your take on the use of leg slaps by wrestlers? Shawn answered, clearly I look back and I go, okay, I did it. I just did one. I'm always of the cloth. I can remember. <laughs> what? Wait, what? <laughs> I'm always of the cloth. I can remember when I started, people were telling me, too fast, too much, to this, and there's a balance there. They were right in some respects, and at the same time, the business also evolves and changes. Football isn't played the same. Basketball isn't played the same. So I don't know. I'm somebody that embraces those changes. I feel like somewhere in the middle and balance is so important. I appreciate the style of today. I appreciate the athleticism of the performers of today. Are they perfect? No, but neither were we. So that's the quote there from Sean Well, that Michaels. was very non-committal and hurting of no one's feelings. Right. Well, of course, he's working with a lot of the people like Gargano, who are the main <laughs> offenders. When <laughs> and I'm just thinking, that's also... The most reasoned, if you took every public statement or private statement that Shawn Michaels made between the years of 1992 and 1998, you couldn't come up with one that was that coherent, reasonable, rational, and, and designed specifically to offend no one. Well, he is of the cloth. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, he works with a lot of these guys in NXT actively. So what Dave did, I hadn't seen this, but he took that quote in the same little article, or not article, but this little section here of The Observer. He combined it with apparently a quote from Bret Hart during a virtual signing at the Asylum Wrestling Store, whatever that may be. And here's a quote from Bret. Again, counter this with Sean. I heard a few days ago that they outlawed or banned or nobody's allowed to do the leg slap stuff anymore. And I'm like, Totally. They should have stopped that 10 years ago. It's slap, 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 slap. And my brother Owen was one of those guys that started a lot of that. He brought it to, as a uh, comma there, I don't know if that's uh, a word is missing there. He brought it to, he was one of the best at slapping his leg on spin kicks and stuff. But come on, enough is enough. In every match, you see guys do stuff and you're going, that wouldn't even make a slap sound. <laughs> when you punch somebody in the jaw, it's not a slap sound. You know, it's a different kind of sound, and you're making a slap sound for everything. Every single move you do is a slap sound. Slap, slap. And I totally agree. I'm glad they put their foot down on that, but they're like 10 years too late. They've already kind of, in a lot of ways, sadly, ruined wrestling by making it so fake. Now, here's the thing. There, Bret Hart, retired, has all the money he needs, has no, he's not beholden to anyone and doesn't have to fucking uh, tiptoe around anybody's feelings and just honestly tells the truth. Shawn Michaels, still affiliated, still beholden, has to tiptoe around and, and fucking make sure he doesn't offend anybody instead of actually coming out and saying pretty much, and he probably would say uh, the same thing. You think so? Uh, mostly, not as much as Brett, because he, you know, he. It, and I'll agree. If you throw in a leg slap every once in a while, it used to be impressive until everybody figured out how everybody was doing it, and everybody does it. But nevertheless, go back twenty-five years, or however many years it would be. Who thought that Shawn Michaels, the fucking 
outlaw, the renegade, the wise ass, the guy, he, he's a loose cannon. You never know what he's going to say or do. He's unprofessional, blah, blah, blah. He's going to be the corporate guy in 20 years, fucking given the corporate line and not offending any of the new talent. And Bret Hart, who had actually signed a contract that would almost still be in effect today to be the corporate ambassador and, and life after wrestling and always be a, a part of the WWF, he's the one coming out and saying, yeah, they fucked this whole thing up. That is a complete flip-flop, is it not? From the la from twenty five years ago, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's interesting to me. I know again, times have changed, but to read this from Brett and know that Brett agrees with pretty much what you say about the issue, but the fact that he used the word fake, they've made it so fake. It's always weird when you hear a wrestler from that generation, even in putting down the content, use that word still, the word fake. It's, I mean. It what else can you say at this point? I mean, we'll talk about, you know, the sketch comedy program that they do on TNT, but you know, what else can you say about in a lot of cases across the board? Because we every time we watch a WWE program, we said, boy, they got some great, well-trained athletes. And this whole thing is just sterilized, scrubbed and, and preposterous and can never happen from whether it's in some cases what they do in the matches to in some cases how the matches come about in some cases stuff that doesn't have anything to do with matches it just it's just silliness and nobody believes who they who they are because they can't a lot of these dull-witted and I don't mean that in terms of intelligence, but just the the dull, the monotonous, the unblinking eye staring ahead Stepford wife delivery on a lot of these promos or the the fact that you can hear that there's no genuine emotion in the in the recitation of their lines is because they're in a lot of cases trying to talk themselves into this shit. They halfway either don't understand it or don't know how they're going to sell it don't believe in it. So therefore they can't sell it to somebody else. They're trying to read the lines, but they can't have the feeling because it doesn't make sense to them either that, or they're in some cases, they're just rotten promos, but uh, you know, yeah, in almost every way set up hyperbole execution, they have every promotion has in one way or another made wrestling fake. You know, the other thing, too, about the leg slaps, it's one thing if you say it's too often. Just everyone's slapping for everything, and it's nonstop, and I don't disagree with that. But the other thing is there are different levels of offenders. The people who you can actually see their hand because they keep it far enough away from their <laughs> body, and then all of a sudden, but you see them doing it, that's where it's like someone needs to pull that guy in the back and say, if you're going to do this, don't be an idiot. But, I mean... Is that worse or is it worse also for the chops, which do make uh, contact and make noise, but is it worse that everybody now has to chop to the point where when you, like you just said, you've got the guy who throws his arm way out for the slap. You've also got the guy who throws his chest out and kind of sticks it out and the other guy draws way back and they're they're waiting on it and the guy's face you can tell he knows it's coming oh that's that's fake and it's still a real noise but it's fake too because you see them obviously cooperating which is which is what you get when in in, in any I won't say wrestling school cuz you go back to the 70s there was no wrestling school there were a few training programs, but in any training program, the the reason why we're getting what we're getting now instead of what we used to get is because the most of the training programs have just thrown up their hands and said, well, we're just going to let the guys do what the, the guys on TV do these days instead of explaining to them that regardless of what you're seeing, the primary goal of this this occupation is to make it look as legitimate as possible without hurting yourself or someone else and if something's too 
something looks great, but it's way too dangerous. You don't do it. And if something is very clever or ingenious or innovative, but it's obviously visually obvious to the people that you are cooperating and that it's preposterous, you don't do that either. Because there's a bunch of shit in the middle you can do if you're smart. And when people that ran this industry that knew what the fuck they were doing, that's what happened. But now that it's just been thrown open to, hey, kids, let's put on a show, you've got ridiculous amount of shit, which we'll talk about in, in the, they actually had a pro wrestling match on uh, the All Friends Wrestling episode this week, and it meant absolutely nothing because the uh, last hour and 40 minutes were children without a, a fucking teacher or adult in fucking in the room at daycare. So anyway. Huh. <sighs> Hey, uh, speaking of children that are pains in the ass and, or at least child sized people that are pains in the ass, the, the Austin Aries, the, the controversy now on Twitter, is he on Twitter? Is he by, off Twitter? He was off Twitter for a while. Now he's back on, but you can't see him because he's a teeny tiny turnip eating man. He's hard to see. <laughs> but he said something stupid again. I know that's not news, but it's, he put out a tweet where he said that he knew more people personally that had died from taking the COVID vaccine as had actually died from the, and then he put it in quotation marks, pandemic itself, because of course he's, he's a brilliant insightful human being and knows that this is all a plot and it's all bullshit. And he was the one that was having the advertise it as anti-maskless meet and greets. And he's a fucking conspiracy lunatic because the turnips have poisoned his brain. But now he managed to, I'm, I'm surprised he didn't get kicked off Twitter for disseminating or inseminating false information, but he managed to tell people that the vaccine was killing people, that there was no pandemic, and that uh, everybody was stupid for believing elsewise in uh, in one tweet and got a bunch of shit for it, right? I think. Um, You're the one that told me. <laughs> I was under the impression he deleted his Twitter, and then this morning, as we're recording, someone quote tweeted something from him and sent it to me and it was him basically saying he's not off twitter and then when i went to click it to read it on his page that was when i found out i was blocked by austin aries who i could be wrong i don't think i've ever tweeted at austin aries in my entire life well, well no but he blocks people anyway but see the bonerless little turnip eater <laughs> won't fucking uh, uh block me because sometimes he gets notoriety when i slap him verbally or twitterly as the case may be but when i clicked on it i get the basically the guy who authored this limits the amount of people who can see it which is basically saying this guy it wants to say a bunch of shit but doesn't want anybody to see it unless they agree with him so i don't know what he's doing either but for a while because that sean ross sap threatened to come and stretch him, <laughs> put a sandwich on his back and starve him to death, right? That's what started the whole thing. When he said that stupid shit on Twitter, then the other guy said, you're a fucking liar. And I, what, I mean, did Aries then challenge him to a fight? It was like an indirect thing. Like, you know, I forget the exact quote, but it was something along the lines of, you know, come say that to me or, you know, we can get together. And Sean Ross Sapp, who's like one of the young wrestling journalist out there who actually does a great job and breaks stories left and right. It's really him and Mike Johnson breaking stories all the time now. Yeah, it's usually now these days it's it's Mike Johnson or or Sean breaking news and then and then Uncle Dave tries to fix it later. <laughs> he puts it back together. Puts he it back it. together. Yeah, go ahead. Well apparently Sean Ross Sap, I don't know what belt he is, but apparently he studies Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> so he was ready to call Austin Aries on his bluff. And, uh, yeah, I guess that was the end of that. <laughs> that was very funny, though. Very, very funny. By the way, on the uh, news of 
teeny tiny men who seem to be done with professional wrestling because they can't get work anywhere. Did you hear the latest Joey Ryan news? Oh, I saw because people were retweeting it, not in the retweeting manner of, hey, we're supporting this guy for what he's doing, but in the retweeting manner of, can you believe this fucking guy's back again, <laughs> right? That's right. And they, 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 he's, he's bragging on Twitter with, and the, did they give him a little pink medal? Is this what I was seeing him hold on the picture? Not a medal, but you know, people who go through various programs like, uh, AA or Narcotics Anonymous, I believe they get chips, like little chips to uh, notate the specific period of time that you're doing the program or in the well, program. He got a little chip and he was holding it up in nine months without acting out on my sex addiction. No, it's even better than that. Sex and love addictions. And like, he's a. <laughs> wait a minute. He's addicted you're, to love. I'm going to have to say it. He's addicted to love. <laughs> My lips are dry, my hands are weak, I can't tell, I can't speak, I don't know the words to that song, but the girls sang along, you gotta be, a anyway, nine months without being an, a, just an asshole, just a rude, obnoxious asshole, for no reason to people who don't deserve it. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> hold on here. We got to give it, if you can go nine, if, you, if you're a guy like Joey Ryan and you can go nine months without being a rude asshole to other people that don't deserve it, then you too <laughs> well, <laughs> can, get a, can get a fucking chip. Let, let's give Joey the big salute. There you go, big boy. A couple of funny things. I believe he was accused of a number of things. I, I may be wrong, but I haven't read any of these cases recently. I can always consult with Stephen P. New, but I believe it was at a, at the minimum, some women felt pressured into having sex with him, or as he puts it, he's acting out in sex and love addiction. But the other thing is, he's marking nine months free. I could be wrong. I'm just in a, off the top of my head thinking calendar wise. When was he accused of everything? It was. More than nine months ago. Okay, oh, so he, wait a minute, wait a minute now. <laughs> Does that mean there was a gap in between? You mean he stooched himself? He has he has divined himself. Um, yeah. Well, let's see. What is to? It's the first of April. So March. So uh, last June the first. Uh, that would be nine nine months ago as of April first. So he hadn't done anything since he hadn't done anything since people caught him. Can you imagine, imagine someone that. gets busted for murder and they're waiting for their trial? Like, look, nine months since I've murdered anyone. You see everyone? Here's a picture of me in a suit. I've improved as a human being. Uh, <laughs> uh, good luck in unemployment, Joey. All righty. Hey, folks, do you have a pain in your life that you can't block because it's otherwise than Twitter? Well, in that case, I would suggest our friends at OMAX have the solution to your problem because the Omax Cryo Freeze, the CBD pain relief roll-on, the all-natural topical pain reliever that instantly ices out the pain with a one-two punch, no leg slap, of super cold menthol and hemp CBD. There is no THC in this, but good old CBD. But it's the roll-on. You roll it on your back, your neck, your hands, boom. And we've mentioned this for, they've been sponsored for years now. Whether it's uh, uh, my mother-in-law that's had a hip replacement and a, and a knee replacement, or whether it's, Brian, your whole family's on the stuff, and we take a bath in it down here, especially when I'm out working in the yard, when I'm supervising the Monroe brothers. But the point is, it works. It's not greasy and stinky like the other stuff, no messy creams, horrible fragrances, and it works within five minutes of when you put it on. You can improve your training your recovery your performance whatever anyway go to omax o-m-a-x health.com and you can enter the code jce to get 20 percent off the omax cryo freeze roll on and everything on the site remember they got the sport cream they've got the one a day supplements the whole nine yards go to omax health.com and enter the code jce get 20 percent off anything on the whole site Omax, cryo freeze. And that way, 
if you come across the Ryans and the Aries of the world and, and your sphincter begins hurting, we've, we've mentioned do not insert this stuff anally, but rub some on your ass cheeks and get the rid of the pain in your ass that these people cause. You can do it on anything external. This will work on. Sometimes I get a headache and I want to just rub it all over my scalp. I have a sore shoulder it being baseball season. It makes me remember. And I put Omax on my shoulder regularly, and it certainly helps out. I like the feeling, the tingling feeling of the uh, menthol. Wait a minute. You only think about your sore shoulder when it's baseball season? Well, no, but it's baseball season, and I'm thinking about hitting and throwing a baseball, so it makes me think about my How sore shoulder. How often do you hit and throw baseballs? I throw baseballs during the warmer months. I will throw baseballs. I don't. Who, who do you throw them at? I have a little thing where I could throw them. I could pitch into like a little square net. Throw my curveballs. My like a lot of fucking fun. The cur- yeah, it's fun to know if you could still throw a curveball and a changeup and a cutter and a throw splitter. A ball and a- into a net. Yeah. Oh please, Wait, you were playing with cows when you were a kid. Who are you talking about making Wait. fun of anything about having fun outdoors? Wait a minute, did you just spit out like five different kinds of pitches that you're throwing out in your backyard into a fucking net? You're throwing a ball into a net, and the trajectory is probably going to be about the same, except when you miss the net, give or take every... You're not doing specialty pitches. Well, you practice different pitches, different grips, to try to get the ball to do different things. You try to spin the ball. What's the ball going to do? Well, if it's what a the, splitter, the ball is, drops. If it's a curveball, the ball curves. If it's a changeup, you try to take speed off it. No, but, Various well, other things. Maybe fucking goddamn name a famous pitcher. You name a famous pitcher. I dare you. All right. Nolan Ryan. Okay, you got one. Okay, there you go. Nolan Ryan. He might have made that ball do different things, but the ball for you is going to leave your hand and, and hit something on the other end. It's going to go pretty much in a straight line either way in between. Don't flatter yourself, Mr. I've Gun- got a pretty a good curveball. Schwartz. I hate to break it a- to you. I got a good curveball. Well, you've thrown me a few curveballs here on the program, but I don't know if that's your pitching ability. Fucking curveballs. Can you even throw a baseball? I can throw a baseball. Have you ever thrown a baseball? Have you ever played baseball? When I was a kid, I played a little backyard baseball, but I didn't fucking have any different grips on the ball. I just grabbed it and flung it. At who? At whoever happened to be fucking playing (laughs) with me. (laughs) My mother, my uncle, my cousin. (laughs) But no Little League in the... uh... Young no, life of Jim Cornette. No, I didn't like baseball that much. It's just, you know, every, and then I had, I had some Nerf, uh, uh, <laughs> that, well, not the Nerf, but the, uh, the plastic bats for the T-ball and Wiffle things. Wiffle ball. Wiffle ball. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. That was fun. You take those, when you were a kid also, you take those plastic wiffle ball bats right at dusk and go out and get you some lightning bugs. And they had a fighting chance. They're, they've got wings. You're on the ground. You're you out, well, hold on now. You've just opened a whole nother door, a what? whole nother dimension. So you were outside at dusk. Yeah. With a wiffle ball bat swinging at lightning bugs. Yeah, because if you see, here's the thing. If you can get them right when they light up, then when you whack them, it makes the end of the bat glow. <laughs> So that was the thing. You get under the tree where it's where it's especially dark, where you can see them better. And when they light up, you got to swing and, and hit them before they fucking go out. I, I can't what? even. I can't even visualize this. I just see your neighbors like, what is he doing now? What? what He's what, out there killing what, bugs with a wiffle ball bat. What? How is this news to you? What do you people up north do as children when you go out and play in the yard? Oh my God! What do what? How do you what do you do when you go out and play when you're children? I throw for heaven's sake! I throw curveballs into a net. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Speaking of a guy that throws some curveballs, uh, Arn Anderson. We're going to talk about him later on. He was involved in a curveball on Wednesday night, but I read this on the interwebs this past week, and this is just a just an idle statement, just to bring this up. Uh, you know, he was a high-ranking agent in the WWE, Arn Anderson was, for quite some time. Or I mean, he was Cena's personal guy, right? Which is why then he, he, when Cena was 
out of the picture. They could lower the boom on him and get his, him out of there. Cause he knew too much. Um, but he had a comment about our old friend, Kevin Steen working with Steen as a, as a producer. Right. And this was on one of the sites. I don't have it as one of the podcasts that he did. The, the site was quoting. I don't have it in front of me, but I shall paraphrase. Cause it'll, it'll come very close. Arn Anderson's feeling basically was that Kevin Steen would argue the most minute points of anything. I believe the actual word used was minute, minute points of anything until you just wanted to tear your hair out and scream. Basically what he said, that was his impression. Golly, if only he had listened to somebody about 10 years ago say that same thing and warn them and even say, and whoever his producers are in the WWE better have a good supply of fucking headache pills and a lot of patience. Do you remember me saying that predates you as a matter of fact, when I was saying that I've certainly heard you say that you've heard it said if Arn Anderson was you, he'd be accused right now of not being able to work with talent and being out of touch and all these <laughs> things, but he's Arn Anderson. So he could say it. Eve will argue about the most minute details till you can't get anything done. And you're fucking just wringing your fucking hands. Like, can we just get past this and get over it? I just thought that very, very shocking. I would have never thought that about our friend Kevin Owens. Um, it, here's another thing that we don't want to make false accusations here on the program, Brian. We do not want to accuse people of behavior, either unsavory behavior, possibly criminal behavior, certainly uh, behavior that shouldn't be imitated. We don't want to do that if they're not guilty of it. But a lot of people have been saying recently they're watching these promos that Tony, poor old Tony Schiavone, is apparently being instructed to do with our friend, the Booker of the Year, Tony Khan. And these promos are now that Tony Khan, what is he? Is he the... The invisible, he calls it, well, one of them is the invisible hand. Is he the, is Tony's the invisible door and Callus no. is the invisible hand. I believe he now calls himself the forbidden door. Oh, Tony's the forbidden door. And Cat, you know, I saw that movie, Marilyn Chambers and Harry Reams. No, oh. no, 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 no. Oh, boy. Tipped. Hey, now, Tony <laughs> could have got me to work for AEW if I'd have known he, ha he hung around in those circles. That was behind the forbidden door. Well, regardless, so which one's <laughs> which one's invisible and which one's forbidden again? Callus is the invisible hand job, and Tony is the forbidden back door. But they're showing these things on Impact Wrestling, and I, I know people are now going to say, "Well, fuck," then it doesn't really matter because who's watching that? And you're right, but still, it's in public and it's being perpetrated and circulated around the world via the interwebs, but Tony is doing heel promos now to the impact audience, which is there. Can there be any difference? Isn't everybody that's in that comprises the impact audience also watching AEW? Cause isn't it all kind of that same seven, 800,000 people that like wrestling parody these days, that's watching all those type of programs. Well, Impact doesn't have a significant audience. I mean, well, no, that's why I've said they just showed the number they got. They got thrown for a loop. They got bad numbers. Came out with like thirty-eight thousand instead of one hundred and forty thousand or whatever, and they were all panicking. But it was a, a mistake. But the the same hundred and something thousand people watching Impact have to be watching AEW also, don't they? Already, I would think so. Because if you're going to make a commitment to go that far down on the wrestling tree, you're going to be watching most everything, right? And so now Tony is the heel. They've sold him on this. Callus is brilliant behind the scenes because he's pushed this Mark's buttons and knows how to phrase it. And they were already fucking enamored of Olivier, old twinkle toes anyway. And since he and Callus are friends, this small outlaw promotion on a cable station that not a lot of people watch access TV have been invited to be guest stars and or main characters on 
a program on TNT that seven or 800,000 people watch. And in return, Tony Khan gets to go over and be heel, be a heel and do promos in impact. It's kind of like the reverse of when Vince was a heel in Memphis, the absolute opposite, the mirror image of that. Instead of a big fucking executive going down and playing in a small territory, it's a, an amateur booker going and playing in a smaller territory. And it's bad. These promos are bad. And it's obvious that nobody is telling him because they're scared that they will offend him in some kind of way because now he's fulfilling another of his childhood dreams by getting to be a character on television. But I've got to say this out loud, and then, Brian, you can discuss as you see fit. If the promos that you are doing on, on not just once, but on a regular basis, cause people who do not know you personally, but just are viewing that promo to either think or be absolutely sure of themselves that you are on some kind of drugs, even if you're not, don't you need to change your presentation? You would think, and again, when AEW first started, Tony Khan was very buttoned up, skinny tie, clean shaven, neat little haircut. People thought he looked like Rick Moranis. Now he looks like a mess, and you combine those promos with the erratic booking, the bad booking, the bad formatting, and certainly there are a lot of people actively speculating about any use of stimulants by Tony Khan, and he seems to be running towards that. <laughs> he doesn't seem to be going, you know, maybe I should, you know, shave or clean myself up or act like a professional or act like I own this thing, not like I paid a bunch of people to be my friends and play around with me in a hobby I always wanted to have. But no, it's, it, it's, it's more than that. Take yourself off the air. It's doing your company no good. Is there a positive for AEW? And I'm not talking about Tony Khan never appearing on AEW television as himself ever again, although that wouldn't be a particularly bad idea on the surface of it. But I'm talking about do not go out and do these unhinged interviews being the heel executive of, of another company that are causing everyone look at the comments on every tweet of, of these videos look at the comments on youtube i did people pointed me to them whether they're talking about adderall or methamphetamine or coke they're making cocaine jokes it's not just the people who don't like aew it's a lot of people because that's the impression you get and that's what i'm saying even if everybody knows Tony Khan and Tony Khan, if, if you know him personally, you know why he wouldn't, he wouldn't take an aspirin or he's a teetotaler or whatever. If you're creating that image and you're not doing it on purpose for a business reason, and I can't imagine what business reason they would have for wanting their owner, booker, operator to be a drug addled speed freak on fucking television so if people are getting that impression take that as a cue to don't do this anymore you're not good at it you're coming off badly and why is tony shivani kid you kid tony jim ross somebody that he would listen to can you take him over to court and say tony Let's look at this video together. You see how you might be coming off to people who don't who don't live in our bubble? And maybe this is not a good idea. Can anybody talk to this fucking guy? No, he thinks that his ideas are swell. Remember, nobody's going to write my TV but me. Then does as we'll talk about uh, when we talk about his program, does nobody have any integrity in their own selves then and can't come out and say, what the fuck are you doing? Whether, the, whether he likes it or not. 
fuck? I argued with Vince. Vince is a lot harder to argue with than goddamn Tony Khan. I didn't scream at him and call him a motherfucker, but I argued points with him when I thought that he was in the wrong. And in many cases, he probably still was, but he won. But at least I said it. A couple things, you know, we could talk about it later, but based on the results, the ratings and other things, the questioning I've been doing for weeks now, I think is more glaring about why they would work with Impact because it doesn't seem like there's any benefit whatsoever to AEW, but we'll talk about that later. I put on Twitter that these Tony Khan promos, he sounds like Crone Meltzer on Coke. Do you remember Crone Meltzer? No, no, I thought you were making that up as a knock on Uncle Dave. No, no, what no. Are you talking about? There was this kid who, like, in the, I don't know, like, 2006, 2007, started putting up these videos. He was feuding with the internet wrestling community, <laughs> and his name was Crone Meltzer, and the funny part was he could never pronounce his own name, so he would call himself Crone Metzler, but he spelled <laughs> it Meltzer. Let me play you a little bit of Crone Meltzer. You've got this on, on hand. I have it pulled up here, one of his videos. There are several amazing videos. And tell me when he starts yelling if it doesn't sound like the same tone and voice as Tony Khan. Hold on, here we go. Jack Valley Driver, message board. <laughs> Should be spelled B-O-R-E-D. Every time I get on there, that's the way I feel. I go out to give you guys my freedom of speech, tell you the breaking news about Randy Orton, and what do I do? I get shit on. For what? For what? Breaking the news to you? Me trying to tell you guys about what happened at ECW one night stand? What happens? I got all you people out there like spunk all hating on me. How do you think that makes me feel? Huh? You don't know who I am. I am the real deal. I give you guys the news when it comes. Crone Metzler can tell you guys what's happening, when it's happening, and why it's happening. Because the internet wrestling community needs to know. We don't want to hear about some guy named Kent Jones, obviously. We want to be here about Crone Metzler, the real deal, the man who should be leading the IWC across America. You need to understand that when the time comes, I'm going to be taking over. I don't care if it's Death Valley message board or what it is. I am going to be taking over. And that, my friends, is the truth. Tell me that's not Tony Khan. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Tell me that's not and Tony see, Khan. <laughs> for the normal people out there in the listening audience, I can tell you this is not new. We, I did this when I was a teenager. In the see, you're doing promos with your friends, and then you have the matches, whether it's the high school locker room or out in the backyard or whatever the fuck. Of course, we didn't use kendo sticks and moon salts off fucking the roof then or whatever we actually worked but nevertheless in 40 years in this business oh i thought you were going a different way i thought you were going to well, say this isn't new taking the money guy and putting him on tv to a well, piece no, of well I'm, I'm not there yet i'm going all the way back it isn't new that people want to play wrestling and pretend they're wrestlers and want to be wrestlers and used to say before the days of deregulation it was very hard to become a professional wrestler. It was very hard to be let in to the business and smartened up. It was very hard to get a chance to get trained. And then when you did, you had people who had years and decades of experience in the business and knew what lines, especially in their territories, to step over into the ha-ha and the gaga or how to present their product or whatever. And there were obviously certain things that you would not be allowed to do. But with the last 20 years of the internet and deregulation and outlaw shows and indie shows and hey kids let's put on a show and there being no quality control whatsoever about who promotes wrestling or what kind of wrestling they promote or who can get into a wrestling school or who can train a wrestling school as we heard in the earlier in the program the guy kicking the other guy's face in and all this other shit all these people who I've been seeing this for 40 years, but you didn't get to see it in public. I've seen the audition tapes that were sent in by people who wanted to be wrestlers and thought if they could cut a promo and put it on tape and send it to the WWF or whatever organization, 
that they could be big stars and they they don't have mirrors and they don't see it understand how this works i've been seeing it through the the generations but those people were never allowed to be wrestlers those people were the 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 basement bookers and the fantasy wrestlers played with their friends but they weren't allowed to become a part of the business because of the mindset of people who do promos like that and think they're good. Now they can be. And when you, now I'm going back where you were going, Brian, when you combine the fact that he's always wanted to do this with the fact that his father has a billion dollars they they got Dixie on television in the dying years when she was when she somebody ought to go back and do the timeline and figure out if they can when Dixie's parents cut TNA off for more money and when Dixie showed up on television. But it's old as the hills. You put the angel on TV. Remember, I told the story about when Buck Robley was going to open up New Orleans again, brought me down for those NWF TV tapings at St. Bernard Civic Center. Yeah, I remember that. And the money man was the the manager that looked like Elvis that Buck Robley had met at the fucking racetrack. And I came in and sold him in, in two TVs. I came in, established Ron Powers, sold him Ron Powers' his contract, then he was going to be a heel manager. And then Buck's thing was he was going to milk him for three or four months and then turn the guy baby face so he could get some more time out of him and have the guy given... <laughs> giving going around the poor areas of New Orleans, giving tickets to free tickets to the wrestling matches to the kids. You get the angel on television, you get the backer on TV because they wouldn't be putting money in it. Well, you know when you can. I wasn't going to get Rick Rubin on television. In those days, you could barely get Rick Rubin on the telephone. Um, <laughs> Some things like, don't change. Well, exactly. And it, it's it, how many television interviews have you seen with Rick Rubin ever in history? He's not a, a person that goes out and hogs spotlight, right? But in in some cases, you could tell it was an old fucking old as the hills as the carnies in wrestling. When you got the angel and he's always wanted to be involved in this, especially if things are going bad, get him on television, get him hooked, give him a taste of it, let him let him play, let him be who he's wanted to be when he did promos in the mirror, whatever. Well, the interesting thing, too, is it's not AEW putting their angel on TV, which would be him putting himself on TV. It's Impact realizing they need AEW saying, yeah, we'll do this deal yes. and We'll put you on our TV. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not even, yeah. It's, the, but the point is, he's not a television performer. A lot of these guys aren't. You will find that that's what exposes most of the indie-rific wrestlers that are the sensations on the indies whenever they actually show up at a promotion sooner or later that has a television show that's what exposes them and then you find out that while a a bunch of people that were going to a, a show 300 people that were going to a show at a rec center somewhere in pennsylvania went there determined to love it if you took a shit in the ring and threw it at them and that's how guys like jelly nutella get a, a reputation because they're raving about the shit they saw Literally, the shit they saw taken in a rec center in Pennsylvania. But then you put it on television, and the average person who does not have the inclination to seek out the rec center in Pennsylvania just to go see Jelly Nutella turns it on because it's in his house now. It's in his living room. It's on his television. And he goes, what the fuck? That's with a lot of the indie talent. That's where they're seen through. But nevertheless, the point is, if you don't have, if you're not a friend of Tony Khan's and you don't want to stop him from embarrassing himself, then go ahead and let him keep doing these promos. But shouldn't somebody just say, you know what? Even if you fire me, I've just got to say this. You're acting like a fucking imbecile. You make the company look like a, I started to say this with a straight face. You make the company look like a bunch of 
idiots play it around, but then again, there's their television program. But it's so unprofessional, it's so amateur, and it's another example of this is a a vanity project and gratuitously to appeal only to people who like parodies of pro wrestling. But somebody needs fucking talk to Tony and, and at least decaf or something. If is that or you know, if if this is the sign of a because people are saying he's turning into Herb Abrams. And then you get the still frames of Herb Abrams wide-eyed and coked up next to Tony Khan wide-eyed and in over his head. And you go, oh, maybe there's something to it. And I bet you, I bet you, here's the thing, though. He's at least, he's not going to, Tony, if he goes out that way, I bet you he won't even at least have the hookers. He'll have the cheerleaders. No, but what I was going to say is, again, the dichotomy that people recognize is that when we first saw Tony Khan, again, skinny tie, pea coat, nice little haircut. Now he looks like a coked up raving lunatic. <laughs> and Tony Schiavone just standing there. It's this, it's so funny. So you want to be in a wrestling business, kid? Uh, someone show looks- someone show that to his dad. <laughs> I mean, <it> was just- <laughs> someone show he, his dad. He looks he looks like one of the boys that used to try to follow Flair around at the bar and keep up with him. Uh, all right. As we, we, we skipped a week last week in talking about Young Rock, did we not? Because there was no wrestling content on the program, and you actually forgot to watch it. Yeah, I forgot to watch it. I think what I heard was it was just him and the Leah Maivia character for the episode. Or him well, yeah, mom, well, it, it was some family. It was family interaction. It was very heartwarming, very heartwarming. Warm to cockles of my heart right up. Um, but this week, you and I both wanted to watch because it's not only back in 1982 in Hawaii, the big battle royal that we saw milked a, a couple of episodes previously. What's going to happen? Wrestlers are bailing on Liam Ivea to go to work for the fucking opposition promoter that is apparently based out of whole cloth. I don't know where they got this guy. Uh, he's of the cloth like Shawn Michaels. Um, but also he, Rocky young rock spends the day with Andre the giant. So this was a can't miss episode. I have come to a conclusion. We couldn't figure out. Is this a, is this a comedy? Because parts in, try and in some cases succeed to be funny. Is this a drama? Because there is heartwarming family interaction. It is based on true things that actually happened to The Rock. But this program is to professional wrestling what Gilligan's Island was to the Hawaiian tour business. And they could have made it more legitimate and still make it entertaining, but this it's it's gotten preposterous with the wrestling part, at least. What did you think? You know, I've been pretty lax on their historical inaccuracies because it's a silly, stupid show. It's on NBC. But this week was the week I was like, you know, this show sucks. And Dwayne Johnson from a historical point of view, is doing a real disservice to wrestling history because there are people who are going to see this and really believe that there was, in 1982 in Hawaii, Randy Savage and the Iron Sheik and Andre and... This is like putting Abraham Lincoln in the 1880s. It just visually doesn't yeah. make sense to people who know anything about... But also a finish meeting for a battle royal in Liam Ivea's living room <laughs> days before the match. Yeah, that was something. And, and 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 like you said, any of those people being in those gimmicks in, at the same time there together, which didn't have. I, yes, I guarantee you that one day, Andre the Giant probably was on the beach with Young Rock when he flew in to do a show. Here's what I guarantee didn't happen. Leah Maivia and her stooge never barged into Randy Savage's hotel room while he was fucking his girlfriend, whatever her name was, Brenda or whatever her name well, was. Brenda, <laughs> yeah, because I bet a, where Elizabeth was still a dad in Lexington, Kentucky, and wondering where the fuck's Randy? Why is he in Hawaii when he's booked here for us? 
<laughs> um, but no, that didn't happen. And no, Lee of my via never double crossed Rocky Johnson by having the iron sh- changing the finish and having the iron Sheik beat him in a battle royal because the- she saw him having dinner with the opposition promoter. None of these things happened and c- couldn't have happened in this fashion at all, ever in in that. <sighs> it's like you said, you know, there's historical inaccuracies that you can kind of deal with things that you are done to forward the narrative. But right. when it's just completely ridiculous, like you brought up Abraham Lincoln. Imagine if there was a scene like Thomas Edison lights up lower Manhattan and there's Abraham Lincoln and yes. there's George Washington and everyone's there watching this. And it's like, yeah, You're these are characters happy. from history, but none of them coexisted at the same time. And that's what it is. It's like, okay, we really like the characters of Randy Savage and the Iron Sheik and the Junkyard Dog. Why don't we just take all of these characters and put them in a time and a place they never were? Because why stop here? Why not do like Randy Savage and the Iron Sheik fighting vampires and fighting (laughs) zombies? That would be better than this. That would be better than this. Oh, and and the idea that all these these major names in wrestling just hung over around Hawaii for weeks leading up to this big match. And 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 then you know, I mean, I know on a on a, a certain level you can tell that The Rock wants Atta to come off as the sympathetic, caring parent, which she probably which she indeed was. was. Which she, she was. She actually was. Yeah. She actually was. Nothing wrong with that. And while he loves Rocky as his father, Rocky was as full of shit as Christmas turkey on a lot of occasions and was shady and et cetera with the, and they captured that in a, in a fun loving and kind of rascalish way with the Rocky Johnson guy. And as I mentioned, Atta's my favorite character on the whole show. Um, and, and there are, there is truth to some of these stories that the whole show is written around but between the setup and and of rock running for president and then the flashbacks and it's jumping around chronologically and i'm just driven to the point of distraction by all these people who never who like you said abraham lincoln and george washington were both presidents but they didn't interact with each other and 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 just seeing the they're trying to do a halfway decent job in the re- in the in-ring reenactments with these actors who are mimicking the guy's moves. You can tell where they've watched them and studied them. It just, of course, it looks like, you know, and that may be for the better, that the wrestling doesn't really look particularly real because it shouldn't if they're doing this for a television program. And the logic of pro wrestling being legitimate, you wouldn't want the actor's doing it on television as a recreation to look as good as the boys. So I'm fine with that. But just as a person in the business would know, they didn't have the meeting for the fucking battle Royal three days ahead of time. And Liam Ivey's apartment over fucking dip. Uh, it w- wasn't how those things were done. And those people weren't there. And this opposition promoter is preposterous. And he's going to give Rocky a canned ham and a giant fucking necklace. And the one the opposition promoter to begin with wouldn't have gone to members of Leah Maivia's family above all else. And because they've as, and we've got to get somebody that knows that whole story uh, here on the program sometime to explain how dangerous it was to fuck with Leah Maivia to just her business without even trying to infiltrate her family. I like the meeting at ringside. When Rocky says, you know, Yeah, when they just talk it over. You double crossed me. Oh, I knew you were going to double cross me. Oh. No, I was trying to help you. It, it's so ridiculous. And, all, and, the, and the people were cheering the Iron Sheik because he was, he fucking dumped Rocky Johnson and it didn't, I, I don't know. You know, he had a show, The Rock had a show that he produced on HBO called Ballers. And I tried to watch it a few times. I saw some of that. It wasn't that bad. I don't know yeah, that much about it football. Was, and it wasn't that good either. I tried to watch it. I couldn't get into it. I'm starting to think maybe, I know you got lots of money, but maybe just stick to action movies and stop trying to produce television because it's not good. This show is not good. This show is really bad. Go work on the XFL. Stop doing this. Stop. To quote Ole Anderson. Don't do this anymore. Don't do this anymore. 
bad. Just uh, the show is infuriating this week. It's just you know we put up with so much of just these guys weren't there. This never happened. But this week was the week. It just went over the top. Well, you might be a handing out battle, but not even handing out finishes. Booking the battle royal yes. in the living room. You will then do this, and then you will go over the top rope. And you mean to tell me they eliminated Andre? The one guy known for winning battle royals got eliminated by the Samoans and Rocky Johnson? But whatever. None yeah. of this happened. It doesn't even matter. None of this. But they got a great 1980s soundtrack. There was Laura Branigan. That was it. What other song from the 80s was in this episode? Um, I forget now. I think it was just Laura Branigan singing Well, they, it was over and over, so that was kind of what was in my head. But remember, they've used some Rick James in the past. They've, you know, they got the flavor of the 80s. Why don't they just put those characters in the story, too? I think Laura Branigan can sing JYD to the ring. She, you think she could have... Your son grab them cakes? Well, no, JYD, remember, he jumped ship because he wanted to move past being a junkyard dog. He wanted to be a penthouse dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid. Oh, my God. Whoever's writing this show, I don't know. I think maybe they work for AEW. I mean, that's the other thing. This whole thing with Rocky Johnson being propositioned by the Hawaiian cowboy character, this was like three weeks ago, a month ago. And then they just never referenced it again, and they moved on to other stuff, and then they bounced back to this. But if you haven't been watching every week of this stupid show, you wouldn't even know what they were talking about. Well, oh. that that's it's your fault for missing it. It's my, ple there? It's my pleasure for missing it. It's, 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 it's must-watch television. Television that you are forced to watch, and that's what we've got going for us there. But did I mention... The fantastic 80s soundtrack. I believe I brought that up, didn't I? You did. And as a matter of fact, if you have modern wrestling that you can't stand the sound of, or you want to go back to the 80s when wrestling and music and everything else was superior, and you want to listen to your own thing, I know exactly how you can do it. By taking and sticking in the Raycon wireless earbuds into the sides of your head. Folks, the Raycon wireless earbuds are perfect whether you're catching up on a new podcast, whether you're binging an audio book, whether you're doing your workout, you got your playlist there with all the up-tempo music so you can exercise until you have a stroke and drop over and they call the police and everything else. A pair of Raycons in your ears can make all the difference. They don't have the dangling wires and stems. They come in stylish colors. They got a comfortable in-ear fit water and sweat resistant so if you're a heavy perspirer or oftentimes shower with your your uh, raycons in you won't have to worry about it it pairs with your blue teeth every single one of them six hours of battery life or playtime on the battery life and great sound accessible to everyone because the raycon wireless earbuds started half the price of the other premium audio brands as a matter of fact hotchkiss feather bottom he got uh, he got not only a pair, but he got a spare. You know, the promotion we got going on, grab a pair and a spare. He's got, uh, he got the pair, and then he got another pair, so now he has three of them that he uses regularly, and he's got one extra. Because he's got that, he's not entirely sure whether that opening in the back of his ear is where the hearing goes out or not, so he sticks one in both just to make sure on that side. Anyway, right now, Raycon is offering 15% off all of their products. For the Jim Cornette Experience listeners, here's what you've got to do. Go to buyraycon, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. You're going to get 15% off your entire order, so you can grab that pair and the spare. And then if you're like Hotchkiss and you have that extra orifice, you'll at least have one left over. 15% off at buyraycon.com slash J-C-E, buyraycon.com slash jce how many openings do you have in your head brian i'm not even going to dignify that with a response well i'm just asking i didn't mean to get too personal anyway we're we're coming we're going to get inside your head here in a second because we're coming up on the segment we got to get somebody to do theme music for this the last clips segment which is basically the last clips that of anything i would want to see it's not last clip first of all what a bad name for the segment why is it a bad name? It's clips sent to me by you, Mr. Lass. It's me rounding up things that 
people want to hear you talk about, so I want to make sure you get them so we're not about to record. And I say, oh, did you hear this wrestler did this? And you go, oh, no, I didn't hear that. This is my chance to get these stories in front of you a day yeah. or two before we record so you have time to review, reflect, and look at these uh, various things. I'm, I ain't going to spend a lot of time reflecting on these. So Matt Riddle is no longer Matt Riddle. Now he's just Riddle. Correct. And he's got no first name. He's riding around on a on a scooter, not even a motorized scooter, but a little scooter that you put your foot on and, and push off with the other one and go budden budden. And apparently, from now, what I'm led to believe, also, magically, birds fly out of his ass? Birds fly out of something. I'm going to pull up a clip so I can take a look at it, but I, I don't watch Raw. So I don't know for sure, but from what I've been told... He jumped up in the air, spread his legs out, exposing his his taint and all of the surrounding area for everyone to see, and then birds flew out of his ass. Is what I saw on television. Possibly they were... Oh, I didn't run know you watched. By... Well, that's what I saw on the fucking clip from their television. <laughs> and it, it, possibly they were birds that were hit by Braun Strowman's choo-choo train. I don't know. what it. Does he have a connection with, is he an ornithologist? When in his, in his interview meeting with Vince, when he sat down and Vince said, tell me about yourself, is he the bird man of fucking Cucamonga or wherever he's from out in California? He's California sober. I see that's a phrase now. Maybe that explains riddle. That's the riddle about riddle. He's California sober. Why are birds flying out of his ass, Brian? Because Vince likes it. Vince likes it that way. I never once heard Vince McMahon say, you know, pal, you know what I like is when birds fly at somebody's ass. I never heard him say that. They're spending money on this. That's not free. Well, they're not real birds. Let's just clarify for anyone who doesn't watch no, the show. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. They're, they're computer-generated birds flying out of Matt Riddle's ass that they've obviously had some television technician insert into his ass so that they can fly out when he jumps up and spreads his legs out in the air. And th that costs money. So they spent money on their television program to have birds fly to Matt Riddle's ass. Multicolored birds, too. Either that or they just shoved a bunch of white pigeons up there and he eats a lot of fucking Cheerios. Is, does he have a connection with birds? Well, I mean, he's kind of dizzy, so maybe there are birds circling around his head. When I first read about it, that there were birds in his entrance, that's my first thought was, Vince thinks, this guy's some dizzy idiot. Let's have birds circling his head. Birds are intelligent creatures. Have you ever watched a bird build a nest? I have. I'm, I, I, I'm I, not I, indicting I the birds. To, I dare you to build a house in the same time it takes a bird to build his nest. Well, if it was the same size, that'd be one thing, but listen, I'm not indicting the birds. Well, don't indict the birds. I'm the birds, saying the birds will get even. You've seen that in cartoons. You ever seen the birds? You've seen that in cartoons where someone's a little ditzy and they have birds flying around their head. That's what I thought it was before I saw it. And I realized I they weren't flying around his head. I don't know what the world you're talking they about. They were flying out of his ass. Ditzy birds. Not the, the birds aren't the ditzy ones. <laughs> well, then why are they flying around a ditzy guy? Unless they're ditzy too. Wouldn't you want to fly around a smart guy if you were a smart animal? Look, I can't make sense of this. <laughs> All right. So birds are flying out of Matt Riddle's ass. Anyway, he then, uh, and this was on Raw, and this was on live television, walks up to Asuka and starts talking to her about his scooter and whether they'd like it in Japan. But he's look, he's got the scooter thing up between his legs like his giant dick. And he's fondling the handle. He says, you think they'd like my scooter in Japan? And then he just started laughing and said, I'm sorry, and walked off. He forgot what he was going to say on live television and busted the take. And left Asuka, of all people, standing there looking like the smart one. <laughs> the face she made at the camera. Like she had no idea what was going on. <laughs> By the way, whatever dialogue he forgot... I promise you it wasn't Shakespeare. 
I, no, it wasn't going to be any good anyway, but at least he could have done it. Or if, if nothing else, if he forgot what he was going to say, just, Hey, just wanted to tell you, good luck. We're all counting on you and leave, but just to be an unprofessional jack off and just laugh on live national television. Again, the Vince McMahon I knew 25 years ago would have looked at somebody at gorilla and asked them how quickly that they could write that motherfucker out of every upcoming television program that is ever that would ever be taped by that company ever ever but he they just oh he's so dull-witted and slow and stupid and unprofessional that he can't come up with a way to say all right, well, I'll see you later and pedal on his little scooter on off. <laughs> and scoot put, off. Put on yeah. out of there and scoot his <laughs> ass on off. Fuck these guys. They think this is a goddamn joke. That's that's why it is. This will be a recurring theme through the program. Every time we talk about these people, they think it's a joke and they treat it like a joke, and that's why it's become a joke, and that's why nobody's watching. And if they think viewership is bad now. Wait till people get another year or so of this shit. And speaking of not doing things right, they actually accidentally did something right. And they realized their mistake in doing it right and had to go back and screw it up. And so they broke up the Hurt Business. Was the <laughs> How long have they been together? Was, the, was their shelf life up? Was a bunch of people calling for the breakup of the Hurt Business. They looked professional. They looked great together. They'd been doing well. Suddenly, oh, we're just going to kick half the group out. Why did this happen? I don't know, but whenever anyone writes to me, and probably you too, especially the stuff we're tagged on, I see it. They always say, we know you guys don't like Raw. We don't blame you, <laughs> but you should see the Hurt Business. This is the one thing that makes Raw worth watching. And the little bits we've seen have been pretty good. And Lashley, yeah. I think, has been presented the best he's ever been presented in WWE. And Shelton's great. And Cedric, from what I understand, has been doing great. MVP, this is the role for him. It works. It makes sense. And seemingly for no good reason, they, Out have, of nowhere. they have broken up this group. One show develops factions left and right the other show breaks up the one that people are saying is the best one in years well i saw the the interview and the whole bit of business i will agree with you mvp does a great promo i did i've never seen that much mvp i did not watch almost any wwe when he was active but has he ever been known for promos I, I don't hear when people say, oh, the great promos. Well, MVP's name doesn't come. He's he's doing great. Uh, you know, he he looks the part. He he looks professional. He sounds like he believes what he's talking about. Um, unfortunately, Bobby Lashley's weakness. He looks like a million dollars. He's an incredible athlete. He's a great human being. His weakness is speaking, especially speaking with menace, because he's just a nice guy. He, you know, even though he's a threatening physical presence, he wouldn't be mean to you when he puts you in the hospital. But anyway, but here's the thing. Bobby was called upon to deliver a big dressing down to Shelton and Cedric. And it wasn't good. It wasn't believable because it was a contrived backstory for a turn that they shouldn't have done to begin with. And it's another one of those guys trying to justify shit that they probably had to explain to him and he don't grasp it fully. And he's not the most glib speaker and it didn't, you could, you couldn't feel it, right? He kind of, he couldn't get it out. And then as he's dressed them down, then Cedric is the first one to speak and Cedric He's a great worker in the ring. I worked with him in Ring of Honor. It, Ten years ago, he was good. I'm glad to see he's getting an opportunity. He's a nice young man, but he gave out one of the memorized, kind of a monotone delivery, you know, and then of all people, of all people, Shelton Benjamin, who's never been noted for his promos, he stepped in and saved the thing. 
Because if he hadn't, if, if it was just Cedric, then, well, you know, in that tone of voice, and they'd gone into the physicality, it would be, what's, what's the reason? Shelton bowed up. Shelton started shoving MVP. Shelton had some fire and passion to him. Said, what are you doing talking like that? Blah, blah, blah. And that brought it up enough that when they started the physicality, it, you know, it, it worked and was exciting. He said, then finally, Lashley dumped Shelton, but then he scared Cedric off. Cedric's going to get up on the, he's on the floor. He's climbing up on the apron like he's going to do something. And Lashley turns to him and he just jumps back down and stands there. While Lashley is beating up his friend and supposed partner, Shelton Benjamin, and said they had Cedric stand there dumbfounded like I'm too scared and ineffectual to get involved in this. And it was obvious that Shelton and Cedric were supposed to be the baby faces by how they were treated. Therefore, they made one of the baby faces to be a goddamn pussy. What? I? And then Lashley did a, a fired up promo at the end that helped redeem him a little bit because it was shortened to the point and had some emotion to it because it wasn't an explanation of something that he was trying to give that he didn't fully understand himself because the writers came up with it. But why would Se why did they punk Cedric out like that? I don't understand. I have no answer for you. So uh, none of this made any sense to me. Doing this now, and again, we actively hear from people. This is the best thing about Raw. You should at least watch this stuff, and then they do this. And then they have the match with Shelton and Lashley, and I saw the highlights. Wish I'd seen the whole thing. I didn't know they were going to have it, but we saw the highlights. Whenever we do watch, they don't have anything we want to see. And I loved, you know, both these guys have great backgrounds. Um, Not only amateur wrestling, but Bobby with the MMA. Uh, but they, you know, I think Bobby, I'm trying to remember back to his, I used to give his bio an OVW when I was announcing, but I think he wrestled in the service. And Shelton, of course, was a high-level amateur at Minnesota and was the, one of the assistant coaches on the team with that Brock was on. So they did a little bit. They were uh, Shelton was riding him just a, a tad bit for a second there. Uh, they they used to like to do that in OVW and training. Uh, they've talked about it. Brock and Shelton, and we had Brian Keck and Sylvester Turkai, and you know all those guys. That they would friendly shoot around a little bit. It was it was fun. But anyway, um, as you mentioned, Bobby Lashley is the best he's ever looked. Shelton is ageless. How old would Shelton be now? Shelton is, he's got to be in his mid forties. Yeah, at least. He looks fantastic. So it was two pros and it was nice stuff. And then finally Lashley hurt locked him and Shelton passed out. I, I would have liked to see Shelton elevated more if they had to break this thing up because it, they broke. Usually when you break a group up, you break the group up so two members in the group can have a program with each other. But in this case, he just, he punked Cedric out, so that wouldn't even be believable the way they've presented him anyway. But Shelton could have then stepped up as a, a challenge, and you have another strong baby face, but instead, they broke up the group. Lashley put the fucking hurt lock on him, and he didn't tap out. He passed out, as the announcer was so... Uh, you know, eager to say. So it didn't do anything for Shelton. Does Bobby Lashley really have a lot more heat now because he just punked out his partners? I, I don't understand that normally. And then if for the people who say, well, Cornette said they should have elevated Shelton, give him more. I'm always saying on the other channel, the champion goes 20 minutes with a fucking middle card guy and gives him everything he's got. This is the exact opposite of that. A guy that could be a top guy and you punk him out and don't continue a program that you just started in the previous segment. I don't. And then they showed the match that Corbin had against Drew McIntyre and, and fucking Lashley comes out and hurt locks Drew because that's the match they're going to. But you mean to tell me that Shelton Benjamin couldn't be put in the Baron Corbin position. Not as Possum King, but as a top heel against Drew McIntyre, and then fucking Lashley comes in and, and does something. Instead, just waste Shelton. I mean, Corbin is useless. 
Maybe he's a nice guy. I'm sure they all like him. But it's just ridiculous. I just, and and then when Lashley hurt locked Drew McIntyre two or three times, it was the most boring beat down ever. Because he, he would just, yeah, put the hold on and fucking put him out with it. Okay. But then continue putting it on over and over. It was, uh, what'd you think? I didn't like any of it. I mean, Baron Corbin is one of those guys with go home heat with me. I've never seen anything with this guy that made me want to see more. And they broke up the Hurt Business. I like the little bit side scene of the Hurt Business. And then they broke him up. I can't see how Lashley comes out of that any better than he was. I don't think it did much to garner interest in the Lashley-McIntyre match at WrestleMania. It just seems like bad booking to me on the surface. And I don't watch every week, so I don't know if there are intricacies that we're not picking up on here, but... It doesn't seem like a good idea. I think w- what the intricacy is that we're not picking up on is that they've got a bunch of fucking college-educated entertainment writers that have never seen a wrestling match. No, this is Vince. You can't blame them for delivering what Vince wants. This wouldn't be on that show if Vince didn't decide it was a good idea. Uh... Right? I mean, come on. Th- these kids, uh... I bet you if you left it to the writers on their own, it would be somewhat better than it is now. Vince didn't come up with this. He didn't say he use use Baron Corbin instead of Shelton Benjamin. Somebody's writing for these people. And he and he's buying what they're selling in the writing, but they're writing for these people because they the comedy writers don't want athletes because they're harder to write for. They want goofy, quirky, entertaining personalities that they can do funny skits with which is why Baron Corbin is getting a push with a possum pelt around his neck and Sheldon Benjamin just passed out in a full Nelson. The fuck? Bunch of morons. Speaking of morons, apparently there was some medical malpractice uh, perpetrated in the WWE recently, and that's why we don't get to see Charlotte at WrestleMania. Did you hear this? Yeah. This is something. They, They actually pulled... Charlotte out of WrestleMania because their doctors saw her physical medical results or whatever from a physical or a test or whatever and thought she was pregnant, but she's not pregnant. But by the time they found out she wasn't pregnant, they'd taken her out of WrestleMania. What a bunch of fucking imbeciles. How could you... They didn't even give her a pregnancy test. They gave, it was results as her, are they married yet? Her and Andre, or are they soon to be married? Her intended, her betrothed, whatever. They're engaged. From what I understand, they were going to be married, uh, but they delayed it due to the pandemic and not being able to have a wedding the way they would want to. Well, the point is he spilled the beans when he did an interview and said, yeah, apparently she had some other type of medical test. I guess they test all the talent on a regular basis. And because she had an elevated reading on something, the the WWE doctor said, oh, that means you're pregnant and just told and told her she was pregnant. And, she, and I guess she was like, what? And then told the office and pulled her out of WrestleMania and she took like three or four home pregnancy tests and said, no, I'm not pregnant. By then they'd already done it. So the, R- Charlotte, their biggest female star is not on WrestleMania. I don't know if she's the biggest. She's just most talented. Is not on WrestleMania because they got fucking quack doctors. That's basically it. And then she got COVID, but she's cleared from that. She could be on WrestleMania. And and yeah, boy, I bet she's pissed. You don't get uh, many WrestleMania chances. And, uh, and I believe they even mentioned it, especially she said the women don't have careers as long as the men. So waits a year for the big match, the big payoff. The big, Well, I don't know if it's a big payoff anymore, but you know what I mean. It, it's a big deal to them these days, WrestleMania. And she does, she can't be on it because the doctors don't know what the fuck a woman's plumbing works like. Now she should really get pregnant. Show them. <laughs> oh, God, not her, too. Why no. not? Be back before next year's WrestleMania. Do it now. I would demand a fucking check. 
I'd say, hey, I was here and ready to go. Your fucking quack doctors are the ones that knocked me out of this. I want my payoff. I, <sighs> women. No, she, Every time you got women no, around, you got no, troubles. No, she did nothing wrong. Here. I know. I'm, I'm this Andrade I, interview, though, is really something. It's what well, you well, go, I was about to say, for once, for once, the woman had respect for the business and was ready and willing and able to fulfill her obligations and her bookings and 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 controlled her biological functions while she was under contract and committed to an employer and then they fuck her around and what about andre well this interview we did with hugo savinovich is pretty interesting because that's where this story came from he just said it in that interview and then charlotte had to put out some statement in the nicest possible way confirming everything he said <laughs> and he also said in that interview that I guess when they brought up Angel Garza, at one point they had him cut his hair because they told him they were going to give him a push, and I guess he couldn't have the hair he had to get a push. And then they never pushed him. <laughs> they cut his hair. <laughs> Which... They're big on doing that. Yeah, cut all your hair off, kid. We we want to see what you look like. Well, we don't like it. They've been doing that for like 20 years. Yes. That that pre precipitated the famous thank you, fuck you, bye quote when Doug Basham walked into the OVW locker room, my fucking top heel with the fucking sculptured bodybuilding physique and worked like fucking Brad Armstrong and had long, dark, rock star, stringy hair that was fashionable at the time. And he comes walking in the back door looking like a 40-year-old truck driver with a shaved head. What the fuck? Well, they wanted to see what I'd look like bald with me and Damager together. I called, and Laurenitis knew never to answer the phone on Wednesday. I called, left it on his voicemail. Hey, my goddamn top heel just looked like, walked in looking like a 40-year-old fucking truck driver. If you want to shave anybody's head, then let me know two weeks in advance and I'll book the match and sell some tickets. In the meantime, tell your fucking supposed creative team if there's a goddamn creative and they want to know what somebody will look like some other way, fucking pretend. Thank you, fuck you, bye, and hung up. <laughs> oh, God damn it. Apparently, here, what do you think of this? So we don't know all the details of everything going on behind the scenes, but Andrade, this whole thing with Charlotte happens. He asks for his release. At first, they don't give it to him. Then they give it to him with no non-compete. What does that say? The fact that they let him go without asking him, without demanding that he sit on the sidelines for 90 days. Well, why should he? No, he sh I agree he shouldn't. Well, but no, but I mean, even to them, why should he? It's not fucking Steve Austin. I mean, I'm not even knocking the guy as a person. I don't even remember if I've seen him have a match, but they have obviously presented him as a negligible peripheral personality and he wants to leave and they don't care if he goes so and what use is he going to be to anyone else is AEW can't bring in a goddamn real big star and get them over on their television and make them look like a real big star you think they're going to take look at look at Bluto what they did with Bluto and he was halfway over in the WWE you think they're going to take Andre and Instantly, he's a star. They can't. They couldn't get him over with helium. They can't get anybody over. So why wouldn't they just say, you know? To be fair, Bluto wasn't halfway over for a long time. I didn't. I'm just saying at one time. That's at better than some of was. these guys. At one time he was. Yes. He just he didn't figure out how he did that, and he couldn't replicate it. Anyway, I'm just saying it doesn't surprise me a no compete for a guy that they've used at that level because they've they've practically. See, a lot of these guys, when they bring them in and just do that to them, then they can get rid of them and it's no loss for the company. And meantime, they have actually made it harder for anybody else to get any use out of them because of the way that they've been portrayed there. They look like a fucking schlub. And it's not even like anybody was screaming, hey, if Andre could only get out of here and go show his true talent and colors. So, yeah, I would, if I was the WWE, I'd be encouraging these guys. Here's Tony Khan's number. Here, please call. Maybe he can start you tomorrow. <laughs>
spend as much money of his as he possibly can on all the subpar talent. It's not his or, money. Well, you know what I'm saying. That they don't want or that guys that don't want to be there, fine. You go over here and you'll be having your fucking head stuck through a fucking video arcade game here on TV next week. You go on. Well, let's be fair. It was actually cardboard. It wasn't a real video arcade Well, I know. But <laughs> anyways, I'm sure that that's the first thing I would do. I would... If I was now Laurenitis is back in charge of talent relations, I'll say this. We'll move on to the next topic. If I was him, I would take the talent roster and I'd make a list of the 20 guys that I wanted to fucking get rid of. And I would hand them Tony Khan's number and say, please see, act like we want to resign you and we want to give you more money, but you're just not sure about it and see how much money you can get out of him because we're firing you next week. And that way, it would accomplish getting rid of the guys they don't want. They know that whoever they are, he can't use them properly. So they're going to be no fucking, you're not like giving ammunition to the competition. You get them some money, you get rid of them, and you've made him spend more of his money on people that are of no use to him or that he won't be able to figure out how to use. So he doesn't have as much for if somebody actually comes along that could make a difference despite the way they're being presented. So it would be a, but Lauren Itis ain't that smart. Anyway, uh, we, we missed when we did the hall of fame rundown of all the, the people who are going to be indicted into the hall of, I mean, inducted into the hall of fame this year. We missed the celebrity wing. We, we buzzed past the entire wing and we missed that. Or has this just been announced? I believe it was just announced that I could have missed something, but I just saw this a few days ago. Okay, well, I guess it's it's new, so this is an update. Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner, in the WWE Hall of Fame. I, everybody's going to want us to make fun of this, but I mean, my God, at least he's he's better than Drew Carey, and and at least he's an icon. I mean, the other celebrities didn't they put? Uh, who else was in? At Pete Rose. He's in the baseball wing of the WWE Hall of Fame. Who are the other celebrities? Jeez, off the top of my head, Pete Rose, uh, William Refrigerator Perry. He wrestled at WrestleMania too, so at least he actually had a match. Did they put Chuck Norris in? I don't remember now. I don't know. He th Well, he threw that fucking thigh-high sidekick. Poor Jeff Jarrett had to bend over to fucking sell. But... <laughs> At least William Shatner is a is a, a, a global icon, an entertainment, you know, royalty. Um, makes as much sense as anything else they do, so we can't really pick it apart because it's not a real Hall of Fame. It's a it's a entertainment thing for their company. But I, I, you know, I was there when Shatner monkey flipped Lawler, and I was like, I was shook my head at that point. I was like, fuck, is this where it's gone that William Shatner is going to monkey flip Jerry Lawler. He's going to go along with it. The, the company thinks it's a great thing. And now 25 years later, that looks like Funk and Lawler in the mid South Coliseum. I found a list of celebrity inductees into the hall of fame. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, this one, they're ranked. This is from the, <laughs> they're ranked. Well, this, this is from the Sportster website and they ranked the top 10 in order celebrity inductees based on there being 10 at this point in time the 10th so in last place drew carey who was inducted in 2011 number nine snoop dogg don't he's a great rapper you can't say anything bad about his rapping okay does it you know i know a guy that can pump the hell out of a septic tank does that mean he needs to go in the wwe hall of fame he may go in the AEW hall of fame too from that well that's but they'd have to pump it first number eight arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> well i you know but in all honesty if you're going to induct celebrities and he came and and was he was into the business in his day he respects the boys He's a global mega politician, movie star, et cetera. And, you know, so if you're going to do one, I guess you could you could do worse than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Number seven, Kid Rock. Speaking of doing worse than Arnold Schwarzenegger, there you go, the exact opposite. Instead of the governor of a state and a 
star in major motion pictures that have grossed billions of dollars. You've got a fucking white trash trailer park redneck that fucking thought that Donald Trump should be the president. So, But you see, that's where you're wrong. He was a rich kid who took on the persona of a trailer park, whatever you said there. So he's a fake white trash trailer park redneck. Yes, because if you remember, originally he started, he was a rapper. He had a kid and play kind of haircut. I believe his dad is loaded and he was a rich kid who started doing this. So the whole, you know, wearing a wife beater and this and that, it's all part of his gimmick. He's working. Well, he's gimmick. so, but then he's the worst kind of fucking right wing Republican crackpot because he's really fucking just working all the goddamn poor white trash Republicans that have been deluded into believing that Trump and people like that have their best interests at heart. And he knows different. Because he's a rich fucker. He's not really a trashy, redneck, fucking crummy, clothes-wearing, coupon-clipping piece of shit. He just wants those people to buy his records. So he's worse than they are. There are probably several words there. I'll have to bleep off YouTube, but number... F are you sure there's several? Several. Several? Num number six. I agree with this one. Bob Euchre. What? You agree with what? That he should be in the WWF Hall of Fame? I absolutely think so. Bob Euchre. Arnold, Sch Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Fucking Bob Euchre. Okay. Number five, Pete Rose. And again, they're baseball heavy here. Again, for using celebrities, like some of these, like Arnold Schwarzenegger appeared on an episode of SmackDown. Pete Rose like ran in at WrestleMania to attack Kane three years in a row, whatever it was. So at least he has in ring time. Just for money to go to the Mohegan Sun. That's all he was doing it for. Number four, William Refrigerator Perry. Al, where's he been last 25 years? I don't know, but number There you go. Number three. He, he was he was very no pun intended, very big in his day. Everybody was talking about Refrigerator Perry for about three years. He even had a G.I. Joe action figure like Sergeant Slaughter. But I thought actually that was the refrigerator that went with the Easy Bake Oven. Number three, real estate developer and reality show star Donald Trump. Oh, fuck. No, pass. Continue on. Number Let's two. Try to put him out of our minds. Number two, real estate developer and reality show star Mike Tyson. <laughs> you know here's the thing it's like they've painted themselves into a corner instead of inducting a celebrity when a actual legitimate celebrity would be willing to be inducted they've watered it down they've got arnold schwarzenegger they've got mike tyson now they've got william shatner those are huge names and then you have bob euchre or kid rock but euchre or Euchre I'm surprised a, Ronda Shear ain't in there. That's a good one. Euchre played a part in WrestleMania 3 and WrestleMania 4. So there is an argument for Bob Euchre. I, I, pl I played a part in, in a fucking assault and battery one time. That doesn't mean I ought to go to jail for 30 years. Um, Some people would argue that. If you're going to put celebrity, well, that's true. If you're going to put <laughs> celebrities in the Hall of Fame, go for the big celebrities. Go for the Arnold Schwarzeneggers. Go for the Mike Tysons, whether they've had any, anything to do with your program or not. If when you induct every D-list jack-off, that just reminds people of when you did these skits that fell flat on their face and didn't fucking work. Tyson worked. He got Austin over. Schwarzenegger's a global icon. Captain Kirk, for whatever he's worth, is beloved now, whether he monkey-flipped Lawler or not. But when you go all the way down the fucking totem pole to the dregs of society and donald trump then you've just you've just pissed all over what you're doing and remember they actually had william shatner and dr lawler when lawler wanted lance russell and kevin dunn said not enough people know who lance russell is so they forced him to not accept but just forced william shatner on him as his inductor even though those two had Maybe had two conversations. Had two interactions <laughs> in their life. Well, and that's another they had Kevin Dunn, that little fucking weasel. Um they expect that people to go 
all fucking just a flitter because these minor D-list celebrities like a Drew Carey is getting inducted in the Hall of Fame, but on a wrestling program, he'd rather have William Shatner give a canned speech about a guy he's hardly ever met than have the greatest announcer in the history of wrestling do the speech and everybody would know who the fuck he was. Because remember, Kevin Dunn is the same person who said nobody in Madison Square Garden in 1997 would know who Terry Funk was. Or nobody is that watching their wrestling program would remember who the fabulous Freebirds were. So that's where you get that from. But he's a complete fucking asshole and an idiot. Number one on the How list. How about all those words on YouTube? We'll see about that. Number one on the list, Mr. T. I can kind of see that. Because he was a major television celebrity network TV star, and he was figured in to their big, the big angle that started the whole thing. So I, I actually, he's probably the one that fits the best. And why is Cindy Lauper not in the WWE Hall of Fame? I think because she hasn't accepted it. Quite frankly, I, I it did. It, it, she has that much bitter feeling <laughs> about. I don't know, but you know who else? Should probably be in here, even though he never did anything with WWE. Andy Kaufman. Oh, good Lord, yeah. Well, see, the thing is, would they they have the footage and Lawler is there? Is there... Would you... One would think that they've tried to do that. Why would they not have? Or is there still lingering resentment because Vince Sr. could have had it first? I mean, you want some mainstream attention. Maybe you can get Jim Carrey to come there and give a speech. Well, if they were going to do that, that horse has left the barn. Well, they would have done that when the movie came out. You could have Bob Zamuda come out as Tony Clifton. But certainly, it, any whoever is handing, 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 handling Andy's affairs, say that three times quick, uh, wouldn't have a problem with it because of all the programs that have been done on Andy heavily mention his wrestling connection. They're not shying away from it. So why in the world wouldn't that have been something to be done? Well, they want the celebrity there in person so they can gawk and fawn over them and, and act like that gets them over to the rest of the wrestling fans that don't give a fuck that the celebrity is there. And that's the, anyway. uh, the celebrity wing of the WWE Hall of Fame. And that's the last, last clip. For more last clips, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have to go to the fine programs that Brian Last does on a weekly basis, such as... Such as, I will plug them right now. Another fine week of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all shows on Twitter, at Super Podcast, or on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. And I want to remind everyone, if you want to talk about classic wrestling or learn about classic wrestling, of course, you can check out Kayfabe Memories. There'll be a site design in the future, or site redesign in the future. But also... The Kayfabe Memories message board where there's a dedicated section to discuss Arcadian Vanguard shows as well as every territory in wrestling history. TinyURL.com slash Wrestling History Forum. This week, a few notes. The latest Super Studcast available for patrons of Ron Fuller Studcast at Patreon.com slash Studcast. We continue our month of Ron learning about territories he didn't spend really much or any time in. Of course, we had Ron talk with George Shire for 90 minutes about the AWA. And now we have Ron learning about the Sheik and Detroit wrestling from Supermouth himself, Dave Drayson, Dave Brzezinski, whatever name I'm legally allowed to use here on the show this week. So here today, the Tennessee stud learning about Detroit wrestling, big time wrestling from Dave Brzezinski. And of course, Ron got talked into giving the Sheik $60,000 to buy the rights to I think Ohio, <laughs> and he got nothing for it, and the Sheik never returned his phone calls. Hear more about that, patreon.com. That was the one Louis Tillette was involved in, wasn't it? And his father, Buddy Fuller. Yes, and, and in Springfield, Ohio, one night, uh, Dundee said they had a hell of a house, but he called back to fucking the office, and Jerry Jarrett, he said, but Buddy said somebody left the back door open, and about a thousand people sneaked in. That man who left the back door open, Captain Ed George, I <laughs> assume. But hear more today, patreon.com slash studcast. A few other notes. The latest stick to wrestling with John McAdam, a look at WrestleMania 17. 
Check it out today at mcadampod.com or search for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam wherever you find your favorite podcast. Also want to make mention of Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now with myself and of course John Arezzi, who was just on the experience last week talking about his new book, Matt Memories. We review classic episodes of Pro Wrestling Spotlight in order. And we are right now in January of 1991. A very interesting episode just dropped. John has Terry Funk call in, plus the Honky Tonk Man. And this is the week that Sergeant Slaughter defeated the Ultimate Warrior to become the World Wrestling Federation champion. And everyone is talking about the angle that a lot of people found tasteless, but some callers actually thought was okay, where Sergeant Slaughter, the Iraqi sympathizer, becomes the world champion, leading to WrestleMania against Hulk Hogan. Hear what Terry Funk thought about that match and this angle. PWSPod.com, or search for John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. You didn't hurt me on that one. The Mothership! Oh, goddamn you. (laughs) Two new episodes out right now. They are available wherever you find your favorite podcast, our annual opening day Star Wars, where we talk wrestling and, yes, even some baseball. Check it out today. Kevin Sullivan, John Arezzi, Mike Sempervivi, John McAdam, Lou Kippelman, Dan Farron, Al Gaps. Kippelman! Kippelman's there! Everything from Kevin Sullivan talking about how he developed a friendship with the Sheik to Al gets his fire alarm going off in the middle of the show and him disappearing. We don't know if he's alive or dead. Check that out today. Plus, 605 Super Podcast, Star Wars, Extra Innings, where myself, Howard Baum, Scott Cornish, the wrestling humorist, and Kurt Brown, a.k.a. Vandal Drummond, sit down for another two and a half hours and talk all sorts of wrestling craziness check it out today all shows available at 605pod.com going back to the beginning or just search for the 605 super podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts the mothership i'm not going to yell it a second time don't worry okay before we talk about the modern stuff we want to go back in time a little bit because we had a discussion this past week on the drive through that a lot of people seem to like, a, a comparison of business philosophies, finances, as you may call it, between Smoky Mountain Wrestling and ECW. The question was raised, well, Cornette, since everybody sa- that wants to discredit your opinion says that Smoky Mountain Wrestling went out of business, then couldn't that be said that Paul Heyman doesn't know what he's talking about about wrestling because ECW went out of business? And then we broadened it to that means anybody that ever went out of business didn't know what they were doing. But in this case, we compared Smoky Mountain and ECW, and we mentioned how much more spectacular the closing of ECW was with bankruptcy and in court and people owed massive sums of money and blah, 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 than the somewhat tidy folding up of Smoky Mountain was. But anyway, if you want to hear that discussion, it's on the drive through this past week, or it's also on YouTube. However, uh, as I said, a lot of people like the discussion and they're fascinated by, you don't get a lot of talk of the inside of business business like that from those days because people were more closed mouthed and didn't know, everybody didn't know what was going on. But also I got a related email this past week that brought something else up, and I thought we could tie all these things together because they said at the Super Bowl of Wrestling that Smoky Mountain Wrestling did in August of 95 in Knoxville, that was the the uh, basically the only thing that we did that, that rivaled in terms of gait and notoriety and et cetera, the Night of Legends event. But the main event was Shawn Michaels against Buddy Landell for the WWF Intercontinental title. And somebody had emailed me and said, well, why did you book that match or how did you book that man knowing that you didn't like Shawn Michaels and what his reputation was and et cetera. How did that come about? And I figured I'd never told that story before. I don't think of all the deep dives we've done. I didn't go back on that match. And also I thought we'd take a look at what we did that night and business wise and how it compares with some other 
big shows that the modern economics of wrestling and the way that the shows are promoted and presented and they cost sometimes a fortune and it's somewhat ridiculous. I thought we'd go back and look at the payoff sheets and everything. But anyway, the way the match came about, I was trying to have a, a follow-up concept for the show in 1995 that could follow the Night of Legends in 94, because by that point, we had already started having a big show in Knoxville every August, starting in 1993, when we, I just put the main event with me and Bob Armstrong in, the, the culmination of the original go-round of our program, where he would put me in the hospital, and it drew our biggest house to date. And I said, that shows they're willing to come in August. I know we had an attractive match, but let's see if we can top it the following year. That's when I put together the Night of Legends, and I researched that idea from Randy Hales, who did a Memphis Memory show that earlier that, that year, but I wanted to put a major card in the ring of modern talent as well as the Night of Legends thing, and that's why we got that that big show. And then in 1995, I said, well, how can we can't do another legend show? So I decided to try to do a super bowl of wrestling event where we would basically have championships from every major wrestling promotion defended. And the inside joke was we did everyone except WCW. And then I said, well, I said every major wrestling promotion. So that was the concept, and because I was working with the WWE, WWF then, I wanted to get an Intercontinental title match. I never thought, at that time, Diesel, Kevin Nash, was the WWF champion, and I never for once thought about even attempting to try to book him. If he would have come, if Vince would have given him to me. And considering some of the other names Vince gave me, he would have given him to me, but I didn't want him. For the exact reason that it would have been the shitty, a shitty match that would have killed my big show. Who did I have in my territory that Kevin Nash was going to work with on an equal basis, sell for, have a good match, and attitude-wise, was he going to be into it and want to come and help a territory anyway since he had never been involved in the territory system? The answer to all those questions was fuck no, right? So in concept, I would have loved to have had a WWF championship match, but I didn't want the guy on my card that was the champion. So I pitched the Intercontinental title to Pat Patterson because at the time, Jeff Jarrett was the champion. And I was setting this show up like I came up with the Night of Legends concept in May for the August show. So the Super Bowl, it was in May. This is how I'm going to end my summer. So as I said, Jeff Jarrett was the champion when I broached the subject. And Pat said, okay, and obviously Jeff's into it. Jeff knows how to work Tennessee wrestling. He'll have a great match with Buddy Landell, who uh, that was that was the challenger all along because Buddy was my top heel at the time, but I was going to switch him babyface toward the end of the year as a result of how all this title match played out. So the working arrangement was that it was going to be Jeff, but then I can't remember the timing, but before we had announced anything about it, he came to me and said, well, we're going to switch the title on what was that pay-per-view? The in-your-house pay-per-view, like a week or 10 days before the Super Bowl show in Knoxville, we're going to switch the belt to Shawn Michaels off of Jeff. And I'm like, ah, fuck. He said, but you can still have Shawn. Yeah, like, is Shawn going to want to do it? A lot of people got to remember at this point, Shawn Michaels was not full-blown Shawn Michaels yet. Um, He didn't have the greatest track record of being a nice guy and a you know friend to all furry woodland creatures but he hadn't got the big push yet he hadn't got into the thing with brett yet it was just all starting so while he was a prima donna he wasn't a complete asshole and i at that point since i hadn't started managing vader yet i i don't i don't recall any issues i'd had with him says okay so they arranged it to be Shawn michaels and the way that we advertised it to make sure that we didn't give anything away was on our television, we promoted their pay-per-view as well as our event. We said that Jeff Jarrett will face Shawn Michaels on, I think the date was July 23rd. On July 23rd, at the WWF In Your House, 
for the Intercontinental title. The winner of that match will face Buddy Landell here live in Knoxville at the Coliseum at the Super Bowl on August 4th. And that way we had one week of TV where we could reveal that it was going to be Buddy and Michaels, and that's when he did that great interview, My Own Worst Enemy. And we sowed the seed with him Iggy and me out of the picture and telling his true life story and how this was his big chance in his hometown. We sowed the seed for him turning on me. Anyway, and Michaels came in and and he was a professional and did the thing that, and they had a good match, even though he complained about the amount of blood in the ring from the previous match, Michaels did. But anyway, that's how that came about. It was originally supposed to be Jeff Jarrett, and we fell into Shawn Michaels because that's what they were doing with their belts. So have I told that story before? I'm not sure if you have on the air or not. Well, now I have. Um, But as far as the, as I said, mentioning the economics of wrestling, this was a full-fledged territory local promotion of a major event. And we tried to tie all the sponsors and everybody that we could get involved. That was also while Fan Week was going on. You were down, right, that year? I was. I'll never Um, forget the in-ring promo from Judge Otto Dealer. Oh, my God. (laughs) Uh, You know, but this was a full-fledged... For the people who wonder, well, how do you promote a live event in the days before you just mentioned it on the internet and everybody that was going to come came anyway and you got nobody else because nobody else knew it was happening. Uh, We'd been pointing to this for a month on television. We had a program on the Fox affiliate every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. In addition, we did radio uh, spots. I mentioned the high-priced WIVK radio spots, and we also did television commercials uh, with Fox 43, and we also bought spots on, as I recall, Channel 8 back then was showing the WCW program. We also had... Uh, the guys at the Coliseum early that day between noon and three for the Fox 43 kids carnival, white boy and Tracy and boo Bradley and Brad Armstrong were out there making nice with the kids. Um, the first row golden circle tickets. Cause we had the highest price tickets in smoky mountain wrestling history. Front row was $25. Uh, the rest of golden circle, the next three rows were $15 each. And then we went to the normal $10 ringside. $8 general admission, $6 kids. Um, but the front row ticket holders not only got the early meet and greet with the stars with refreshments at six o'clock, but they got waitress service from the local Hooters girls, courtesy of Hooters. So you could call the Hooters girl over, give her the money. She'd go to the concession stand and get your hot dog and your popcorn and bring it back to you. You didn't have to leave your seat because this was a long show. Um, I mean, we had people, as you said, uh, auto dealer, judge auto dealer from classy motors was there doing a promo. All of our sponsors were involved. The, um, was that, did we have Mrs. Winter's chicken at that meet and greet? Was that when we had the Mrs. Winter's deal going? I don't recall that at all. So I don't know. Well, but at one point we had a sponsorship with Mrs. Winter's chicken and the guy said, Hey, I'll bring a chicken spread and everything, you know, for, for your, Not only would he do VIP and meet and greet parties, but just for the boys before the show. And I'm like, I'd rather get the cash. No, he told me a a giant fried chicken breast from Mrs. Winters cost him 12 cents in 1995. So (laughs) there was a big markup. Anyway, we had promotion going on all over everywhere. And finally, the night came. I'll give you the card real quickly. The open the opening dark match was D'Lo Brown against Brian Armstrong. Uh, that was a dark match because we were shooting television that night. Also, then the opening match and, and of the show. If I can just jump ahead. in, that kind of ties into what you were talking about before with Jeff. Because remember, Jeff left the WWF when he lost the Intercontinental Title. That also finished up everything yes. with the Road Dogs. They were building towards Brian Armstrong being revealed as the real singer of "With My Baby Tonight." Yeah, and we never got the payoff to that because Jeff left. And then right away, the road dog was gone. And this was right on the heels of that. He shows up on this show. Right. Because he rode up with Bullet Bob. And a lot of the, he was going to go work in Memphis because I was working with Randy Hales at the time on the USWA SMW feud. But anyway, 
The opening match was supposed to be Flash Flanagan and Chris Michaels against Rick and Scott Steiner. Because we were shooting this for television and also for a, a videotape, and I wanted to have the Steiners, a big name, Tay, and I'd called Rick, and he said, oh, sure, we'll make it. And then I called him back after we'd already, I think, announced him the first week or whatever to get some details. And he's like, well, I talked to Scott. We're going to need a grand apiece. I said, what? Because they, when they worked for me the previous year, uh, it was four days in a row, but I paid him, I think, 1500 bucks or whatever. So I was assuming, you know, 500 bucks. It's three hours from Atlanta. And I said, well, I can't pay you guys $1,000 a piece just to be in a match, Rick. Come on. He said, well, I'll talk to Scott. And then I never heard from him again. Guess where they were that weekend? I don't know. In Philadelphia for ECW. Oh, that's right. I do yeah. remember that. Yeah. Heyman had swooped in and said, I'll give you $1,000 or whatever. <laughs> so either that or they were trying to get me to outbid him because he gave him seven fifty. Anyway, so I took the Steiners off. And that was the headbangers opportunity to come in. They had just started. They just got the gimmick and they come into Knoxville and have a nice match and get a win in the opening contest. Then we had the uh, grudge tag team match where Boo Bradley brought in the Mongolian stomper against Tommy Wildfire Rich and Terry Bam Bam Gordy. The Midwest heavyweight championship was uh, defended. Marty Jannetty and Al Snow. And the reason why that the Midwest title was uh, Gary Waronchek, a uh, local promoter and longtime fan in Michigan. That's why I was on one of his shows when I found Bruiser Bedlam. He had been using Al and at the time put his belt on Al because, you know, Al was a great worker. So I went to Al and I said, who in the business can we get? that you can have the classic wrestling match. I had grudge matches. I had tag matches. I had whatever the fuck. I wanted a classic pro wrestling match. And he mentioned Sabu. I said, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. And then he said, Chris Benoit. And I said, I love that. And we called Chris and Chris was somewhere overseas. And then Al said, what about Marty Jannetty? And I said, some of it, I said, if he's on, he's great. So we got Marty Jannetty and they had actually a little bit too long of a classic wrestling match. Cause this was a big show anyway. And they were out there a while, but they great pro wrestling. So that's what I wanted. Then the battle of the giants took place when Unabom faced the undertaker. And that was then you've seen clips on the WWE programs. That was the first time that taker ever got in a ring with Glenn Jacobs. And that was specifically because, A, it was a marquee match, my giant against the most over giant in wrestling, uh, but also because I was scouting and I was representing Vince. I was there. Here's your next fucking pay-per-view guy for Undertaker and Big Show and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, well, the Big Show wasn't around then, but you know what I mean. Then uh, a grudge match because we got to get Bullet Bob Armstrong involved. Bullet Bob against Barry Buchanan, who was the Punisher. And, uh, of course, he was my bodyguard at the time. Uh, so I was involved in that match. Then for the NWA world title, Dan Severn against Bobby Blaze. And obviously it wasn't, you know, any trick to book Dan. He was happy to come in, and, and we always treated the NWA with respect. Bobby Blaze was shitting himself that he was going to get stretched he said, wrote about it in his book i i came in in the bathroom i think in west virginia somewhere i said yeah i'm gonna book you in knoxville against dan severn he was in the middle of a piss and his piss stream just shut off like whoa fuck um for the uswa championship billy jack haynes who was their champion at the time took on brad armstrong who was my top baby face um the main event, when it was going to be Jeff Jarrett and Buddy Landell for the Intercontinental title, that was going to be the part of the double main event. The last main event was going to be for the Smoky Mountain Tag Team Championship, the Rock and Roll Express against Tracy Smothers and Tony Anthony, the thugs, the dirty white boy, Tony Anthony, the thugs. And that was going to be a brand new matchup. We've gone over that in the past. Ricky Morton's and Tracy Smothers' significant others gotten a knocked down drag out fist fight and there was all kinds of heat and 
we had to part company with Ricky for a couple months because the police were involved and his girl was the one that wouldn't drop the charges. So I brought the heavenly bodies back uh, from the, their one year run in the WWF to take on Tracy and Tony uh, as, as, and actually that started the fall program with the bodies and the thugs. But so that was making chicken salad out of chicken shit there because I was sh shitting myself literally over not being able to fulfill one of the two main events that we had pointed toward, but the bodies were so strong. The people, well, you were there. It, uh, maybe did the it people worked like out it for better? the best. It worked out for the best. I don't think uh, rock and roll versus thugs would have been anywhere near as epic as the bodies versus the thugs that was a yeah. fantastic match the table spot with tom pritchard was one of the craziest <laughs> things i ever saw Tracy live went through it they didn't break it they went completely through it like a manhole suddenly fucking opened up and got stuck in it uh and tom's juice job the blood just flying everywhere I think that was why Michaels was upset. Not only was the ring still bloody, but also he had to follow that. And it's going on midnight by the time we got that main event in the ring. But then he and Buddy had a great match. And it ended up, I'm the one that cost Buddy winning the Intercontinental title in his hometown after all those years of his struggles. And the people were ready to see him fucking pickle me. And then we milked it for another week or two until we did the full-fledged thing. And then there you go. So anyway, as I mentioned... That was the card. We also had uh, the TV crew there. We shot a one-hour television program with Jim Ross and Les Thatcher and also shot all the matches for a videotape that unfortunately never got released. I'll, you know, uh, uh, go over that here in a second. And we didn't even put the tickets on sale for this show. Here's the thing, because they charged you in Knoxville every day the tickets were on sale. And we say, you know what, we're going to we're gonna do this this way because it's at the first of the month, August 4th. So we put the tickets on sale on July 27th for because we knew that the Golden Circle was going to go quick, which it did. And then we basically did a one week on sale and we ended up, um, hold on here, where's my right papers? I'm going to get the right one here. Uh, we had, uh, we had 80, $25 seats, right? And we sold 79 of them. We had one comp out, uh, but we did 290 of the $15 seats, 1,832 of the $10 seats, 1,357 of the $8 seats and 379 of the $6 seats. And basically the total with the gate was $37,775. Uh, paid attendance was 3937. We had 350 comps of the cheap tickets out to the radio stations and TV stations. So a total of 4,287 people. So you do over 4,000 people and you do almost $40,000. And by the way, that uh, 30, $38,000 in today's money is 65,580 bucks. This was for a town that we ran once a month and it wasn't a new standalone thing. And that's except for the big national promotions. That's not a bad house. <laughs> but here is another example of the economics of pro wrestling. We did that whole show and still made, walked out with, where's my check receipts? We walked out of the Knoxville Civic Coliseum with $15,400. Because the TV commercials were 340 bucks, the radio spots were 1560. The rent and building expenses that's ticketing, that's ushers, that's police, that's all the Knoxville Civic Coliseum expenses for the 5,000 plus seat arena $4,476.19. Sandy Scott was a heck of a negotiator. We paid $200 to the ring crew, $200 for extra help. The Time Warner cable truck that we got from Charlotte was $2,750 for the rental. We rented the TV lights from a place in Atlanta for $490 and had one of the ring guys haul them up in a trailer. Remember, that's one of the big lighting trees that Pam Lawson went to throw out uh, T-shirts at the Night of Legends and they knocked over? We got we got better ones that are were unknockable over the next year. 
$108.72 for the soft drinks for the meet and greet. The Hooters girls were $84. I think we had to give them like 16 bucks a piece or however much that works out to. And my producer and technical director, my audio guy, my tape guy, three camera guys, the lighting guy, and a grip all together were $1,950, which left talent and transportation. Now, most of the regular Smoky Mountain wrestling talent was on weekly guarantees at that point, between four and $500. In other words, if I ran two shows that week, got on a $400 guarantee, got 200 bucks for each show. But if I could run four shows, then technically that they'd only be getting a hundred bucks per show. I put them on weekly guarantees so that I could reduce the cost of the individual spot shows and run more to have some more money coming in same time, honor the guy's guarantees. And I know people are saying, well, four or $500 a week. Well, here's the thing. $500 then is equivalent to about $863 now. And if I said to a lot of professional wrestlers, you can live at home, you can drive no more than three or four hours to your shows, you can work between two and four times a week at, for me and make $863 a week, and you've got three or four days a week that you can go work in Memphis or you can take other dates if you want to, or you can just stay here and be home and off three or four days a week, that especially with the alternatives at the time where the guarantee in Memphis was $40 a night, uh, they liked it. And then, as I've mentioned, with guys like the Rock and Roll Express, yeah, they were making 500 bucks a week wrestling for me, but they were fucking doing a couple thousand a week on gimmicks and in cash since the statue of limitations has run out. So that's why a lot of the guys who weren't signed to one of the big two companies and who could work Southern style wrestling actually preferred to work my end instead of the Memphis territory at that time, because Memphis's business was down, but they were still running a full schedule. So you were making that the same amount for working twice as many days in some cases. But anyway, since some of these guys, weren't regulars some of them required transportation we had the highest talent and transportation cost of any card that we had ever run ten thousand two hundred and thirty three dollars for everybody Shawn michaels i paid six hundred dollars and his plane ticket was nine hundred and twenty four dollars of course that's obviously uh in some cases vince would send me guys and he'd pay him something as well but that's the same thing i gave the other guy in the main event because i gave buddy a bonus so he made 600 bucks for that match too billy jack haynes brad armstrong or billy jack haynes worked in the match with brad armstrong he was from memphis i gave him 200 dollars. the uswa champion was barely making more than 200 dollars a week back in those days in memphis Tom and Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey, they got 300 bucks because they came in and saved my ass. They started working regularly, so they were on a $500 a week guarantee, plus they were splitting their time and going to work for Randy in Memphis also. But since this was a big show and they saved my bacon, they got a bonus. The rest of the regular Smoky Mountain guys got between $100 and $200 a piece. The USWA guys, PG-13, got $125 a piece. Dan Severn, I gave $400. His plane ticket was $242. Bucks. Janetti worked for $300. Uh, Undertaker and Paul Bearer, I gave both $600. Bucks and uh, because either would have been insulted if the other hadn't got the same thing they did, but also bought Percy a $600 plane ticket. Taker drove over from Nashville. And uh, that goes down to, wait a minute, where's... And young Brian Armstrong, actually, that was the biggest payoff of his career uh, outside the WWE so far since all he'd done is work for me in Memphis. He got 125 bucks. But anyway, um, Randy Hales was there. I gave him $100 to entertain me. And so the combined total expenses for 
the rent, the advertising, the talent, the transportation, the TV crew, and the truck we shot with was $22,391 on a $37,000 gate. Oh, and I forgot about the city, the state tax, but nevertheless. You could make money like that if you could do that in the in a different market a couple of times a year. The problem was, and we had a show the week later in Johnson City, Tennessee, where we made several thousand dollars because it was a smaller show, but it cost us less. And that's what I was saying is we just couldn't find an affordable way to get on television in any markets like Asheville, North Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, uh, Charleston, West Virginia, wherever that would have allowed us to build the market and be able to do these big shows where we'd come out with ten or $15,000 a head in one night a few times a year. But boy, how things have changed. The, uh, the finances have changed in wrestling. Now, it used to be if you were a wrestling promoter, it was a license to print money. Now, if you're a wrestling promoter, you need to print money. And by the way, we we need the, the Coliseum demanded that we have eleven ticket takers at the door, but that only cost three hundred and thirty bucks. When did you know you were going to turn Buddy babyface? Because he, had, um, I'm trying to think when before that he would have been a babyface. Last was it? Was he a babyface anywhere after 1982? Uh, at some point, probably in some iteration of a Knoxville promotion. But the thing is, is everybody in town knew him because he was such a, you know, he was out and about talking to people. You knew when Buddy Landell was around and they all knew he was from Knoxville and some of them had known him since then. And as he, you know, healed and healed and healed, it became, and also I was needing, uh, you know, something fresh and because so, 95, as I've said, had lagged, we couldn't get any new markets and we'd finally quit running Beckley, West Virginia, because it just wasn't going to happen. And and I thought, you know, these people will get behind Buddy, which they they did, but it, we just didn't have very long to, to work that deal. Oh, and I forgot also, here on the Knoxville Civic Coliseum statement, they charged you $30 for a telephone operator to answer the phone in the box office and tell people when tickets were on sale. But... The previous show on July 15th, we had broken one of the tables. So every every month we broke a table, they would they would bill us $74.50 for the table. And that's why we broke all their tables, because they had a million of them. They were those old particle board tables, and they were cheaper than going to Home Depot and buying one. And besides that, the fans knew what the Coliseum tables looked like, because they all had Knoxville Civic Coliseum stamped underneath them. So if you brought in a ringer table, they'd know it. So we always had the fucking announcer's table set up in the same place. And somehow when it got broken, not every show, it was that the wrestlers happened to end up on top of it rather than it was being set up and made a shop class project out of, but they were only 74 50 a piece. So that was a, that was a steal at twice the price. Anyway, any questions before we move along? No, that was my big one was just when, in the process of getting to that show, did you know you were going to turn Buddy Babyface? Well, it, it sometime, as I said, in the in the summer, when I just said, okay, we're, you know, we ran Buddy and Brad, and there wasn't a lot, of, a lot of other people for Buddy to work with as a heel, and I thought that, you know, hometown boy and me and him promoing each other, we can get some some mileage out of that. So sometime in the, in the summertime, and then we just worked that that direction. And, uh, oh, and, and one more thing before I go, just, I hadn't thought of these things in ages that month, the month of August, 1995, we also got $2,635 from the UFC from Semaphore entertainment for advertising their, one of their first UFC pay-per-views spectrum rents kicked in $595 classy motors paid 600. We got $100 as a fee from a cable system in Washington, D.C. for running the program. Uh, the last $4,100 of the Fan Week income we took out of the bank. Got $225 for merchandise and $2,076.24 from Bill Barron's 1-800-BUY-THIS-SHIT 
PI numbers that he ran on our TV. So those are the economics of territory wrestling. Anyway, you want to talk about <laughs> this new shit now? <laughs> I don't even know why they're doing this anymore. They've just given up. Was it an early April fool, Brian? This AEW television program this week? No, I think they it's wanted just, to get the jump on April fool. So they did it a day early. I think it's the usual fools. <sighs> we'll run through this quickly because I'm about tired of it. Christian has his first match in what? Seven years. They've said, and his first match ever, ever in this promotion. And to do that, they, for some inexplicable reason, decide to make Frankie Kazarian a heel out of nowhere last week so he can say mean things to Christian. And then they have this match. Having said that, this is one of the most professional matches that they've ever had on this television program. Because both these guys are veterans and they're polished and they're experienced and they know what they're doing. And they're professional in every way. And it's so out of place on this program, and I'll give you some of the reasons why. But while the match was fine, again, what did this do for Christian Cage? This is inexplicable booking. You take a guy who's not only been portrayed as mostly a babyface, but a middle card babyface in a tag team. Then... He has an issue last week in a snotty way that he's never acted before with the guy that he has not interacted with since at least they've been in TNA. And then you have the match and it takes your new top superstar from another company that is returning to wrestling out of his retirement and can outwork everybody. It takes him 20 minutes to outwork a middle card guy. And I'm not saying Frankie Kazarian is as talented as a middle card guy. I'm saying he's presented as one. And the, the announcers mentioned that Chris Daniels and Frankie Kazarian long ago had said if they lose another tag team match, they'll never team again. And they've never had a tag team match since. They also said, and I'm probably getting this somewhat wrong, because at one point Excalibur said, you know, Frankie Kazarian has one of the best winning percentages in AEW. And then, like, seconds later, he corrects himself. He goes, actually, he has the best winning percentage in AEW. So why is this guy? It's the we first time we've seen, seen this guy in a singles match against a contender if he has the best record in AEW. Because all of the slaves of this program are going to watch YouTube, and they're going to read the results, and they're going to know, but nobody else, they just... Pay attention to what's on television, you dipshits. The people you want to be watching the program that aren't going to watch it anyway because it's a crummy fucking program. But anyway, so Christian Cage has no wins in seven years and is taken to the limit for 20 minutes by a guy that has seldom won or had a single match and is presented as a middle card baby face, but now is suddenly a snotty heel. So was this match to get Christian Cage over or to elevate Kazarian? Is Kazarian a middle card guy in there with a top guy to elevate him? Or should Christian Cage, since he hasn't wrestled in seven years, get a win or two first? So nothing wrong with this match as a match. All the problems were presentation and environment. And also, here's another thing. If you notice when they have two professionals having a professional match, instead of the high school cheerleading routines, the bumps and moves that these professionals are selling are ones that the child-sized cosplayers don't even register and pop up right after taking, even though they don't look nearly as tough and in shape as these guys. So there's a visual disconnect for the viewers when they see an actual professional wrestling match with people selling things and reacting to things, and when they see the sketch comedy wrestling matches where people are just doing a bunch of fucking gymnastics and it that's the point i've been making all along also when you finally do find two guys that can work and could get over their shit looks weak because all these other fucking children absorb much worse because they're idiots and don't realize they're crippling themselves these guys are experienced enough to know what the fuck not to do 
So anyway, then they had another weird video from Darby Allen with Darby's every time he wrestles, he gets over with me. Every time he speaks or you see him anywhere outside the ring, I can't stand this guy. Whether it's that he sounds like he's somed and reading a script off a page or whether it's all this spooky brooding stuff that nobody gets or whatever, he he gets over as an athlete, as a performer in the ring, and then I don't know what the fuck's going on with him as a person. <clears throat> Which was followed by another thing that I don't know what the fuck's going on with this person. Jane Cargill did a promo, but you, Brian Last, I know that you were heartbroken because this was taped. It wasn't live. It was taped, so she she looks like she knows what she's doing and can speak. But you want the live shit, pal. Yeah, I do. I, I get a kick out of her. She's got the, I guess, the right intensity. But if you actually listen to the words she's saying, they don't, they don't necessarily make that much sense. But I want to go back to the Christian Kazarian match. I'm sorry. I just steamrolled you over that. The outwork everybody. I figured out what that meant. He outworked everyone and got a contract that he probably <laughs> okay, <laughs> didn't, right. didn't need. Um. Nothing against this match. It was all right. But when Terry Taylor returned to WCW, if he had a 20-minute match with Barry Horowitz on TV, it probably would have been really good technically. Yeah. But counterproductive. This match was completely counterproductive. It did nothing to elevate Christian. The goal wasn't to elevate Kazarian, and it didn't. So they achieved that, at least. They, they didn't do what they were trying not to do. But the other thing is, when Christian, he had his big debut, which was overhyped, and I think they're still recovering from that. But then, I forget if it was two weeks or three weeks ago on TV, they do the angle where he's about to do an interview and Omega comes out and it ends with him and Omega kind of staring at each other and, you know, he has the belt. No follow-up to that. Nothing since that time. If they even mentioned it, I missed it. But there's been nothing about that. Just all of a sudden, here's a match with Christian. His first match in all these years goes 20 minutes with a guy that we're told on commentary has this incredibly impressive win record that we've just never seen on TV. This whole segment, that whole opening segment, the first 20 minutes, completely counterproductive. Well, I was proven wrong in the next big... The, the, this was just Angle Central. They were doing angles into commercial breaks on this show. I was proven wrong, and I take it back right now, and go ahead, I'll bend over, you can whack me with the kendo stick, no, everything that Cody Rhodes does does not make sense. I admit that now. I'd, had, I'd held out hope, at least his shit makes sense. Wow, when somebody runs off the rails on this program, they do it right. Did, <laughs> could you, what in the flying french fried titty fuck? They have the exhibition that everybody can see coming. It's the Bruno Zabisco angle. The teacher, the mentor, and then the, the, the student, the, the veteran and the young guy. The exhibition match between friends. And here's the thing. When your baby face is fooled by something that every single fan saw coming, you've buried your baby face. So we all knew what was going to happen. We just didn't know exactly... We didn't know exactly what was going to happen because what did happen made absolutely no fucking sense. But we knew that QT was going to turn on Cody. And they they had a nice little wrestling match. Uh, once again, you know, executed well. I wish Arn Anderson would lose some weight with all the heart attacks and bad health and everything. He looks massive. Um... A Cody wouldn't figure four QT or wouldn't crossroads him. He was taking it easy on him. Although, did you notice Cody went for the figure four from the wrong side? Is that something he's been doing and I just hadn't noticed it? He's just a silly young man. I don't know. Oh, anyway. Um, so then suddenly uh, QT's out on the floor. Cody Rhodes opens the ropes for QT. QT gets in, steps through the ropes, and immediately knocks Arn Anderson out. And then just leaves the ring. 
And then all of the nightmare factory or nightmare associates or nightmare family or nightmare collective or whatever, all these nightmares. They they were all surrounding the ring anyway. Anyway, Dusty, or Dusty, Dustin, and Cody's friends and QT students and all in this big group of people. And then suddenly, all the students jump in the ring and beat up all of Cody's friends at, at just at once. And the big guy power bombs Lee Johnson over the top rope onto the stage, flat of his back. Stupidest thing I've ever seen for a bump that nobody will remember tomorrow. He'll remember it. Wrist his fucking neck for a goddamn, a stupid angle on a stupid program that's not going to move the needle one iota in terms of any of their business. This guy is trying to cripple himself to, to get over. Uh, and why do they call him shoddy Lee Johnson? Big shoddy. Big shoddy. That's what they're saying, right? When something is shoddy, it's substandard, below par, messy. Anyway, they get juice on Dustin, which you can't half tell because he's wearing makeup anyway. QT gives a pile driver to Dustin onto the steps that are sitting on the stage that the big guy put there. Then they got a boxer. They've, they've just... While these guys are attacking and beating up all the people we know who the, that is, all the people that we don't know who they are, the announcers are telling us at that point who they are. Well, look, he's a pro boxer. Oh, he just hit Cody in the stomach with a punch. Cody sells the left to the gut by the boxer like grisly death when people are being are popping up from being pile-driven on the goddamn gimmicks. And then finally, they go to assassinate Cody in some kind of way on the stairs. And here comes red velvet, AKA Brandy number two. Remember when they had Kamala number two is Brandy number two. No, this is, you know what this is? This is Snooker going to rehab and all of a sudden the Tonga kid pops up and takes his place in a feudal Piper. All of a sudden she is the surrogate wife, the wrestling wife of Cody Rhodes. And she saves Cody. And QT is on the stage with his back turned to all of the, they did Bruno's setup, but they sure didn't do Bruno's angle. Now, here was a, another massive group beatdown, a turn of people in a group against the, the other people, and a, a angle with blood and furniture and violence and bludgeoning. And it wasn't even the only one they did in this fucking half hour. What? What? Why would you do all of this with all these unknown people all at the same time? There's 15 people out there. Nobody can, you can keep track of this if you're on the spectrum in some kind of way and you're like one of the savants that's great with numbers or whatever. But most people are going, who are these people and why are they fucking fighting? What'd you think? You know, it's... It's all stupid. The whole QT Cody thing kind of shot out of nowhere. Bruno Zabisco was student versus trainer. This and it was, built for years. This was two friends who suddenly have a problem, and QT wants this match to prove he could hang with Cody. And then they do this beatdown. Again, we just saw the inner circle MJF turn a few weeks back. So here's another. Last week. Well, no, that was it was a few weeks ago. It wasn't last week. I thought it was two weeks ago. Okay, I'm sorry. So then we see this, and all these guys we've never seen before, we have no idea who they are, are beating up. You know, you the thing about the Nightmare family, we know a few of these people. Other ones, unless you notice that it's Billy Gunn's kids from the audience, you don't know who they are. Lee Johnson's been on TV a couple of times. You know Dustin. You know Billy Gunn. But no one knows who anyone else there is. So you have guys who you don't know or don't care about getting beat up by guys you've never seen before. And then it creates yet another faction because that's what (laughs) AEW needed. More factions, more Ah. factions. This whole thing was bad. So many people, and I'm going to include you in this, and I think you'll even admit it, have given Cody Rhodes so much benefit of the doubt. I just apologize. So much benefit of the doubt. He is an idiot like the rest. He doesn't understand booking 101. Just because he's Dusty's son doesn't mean he picked up any of the things that Dusty did when he was an infant because he doesn't know any better. 
And the fact that this whole thing was built up as stupidly as it was to get on TV, and then this was the execution, like you said, and we've talked about before, there seems to be a problem from segment to segment where the same thing happens in multiple segments. Shaq goes through a table. The Young Bucks put two guys through tables. Same show, a few segments apart. Here is faction on faction, bloody beatdown. <laughs> wow, that would really mean something if we weren't going to see that in a few but minutes. But wait, there's more. Yeah, we're, it, we had to wait three whole segments to see it again, even worse. Um, and after all of this, Red Velvet in the back goes to have an interview with the girl interviewer and gets, I counted, 12 words, and here comes Jane in and beats her up and walks off. So they actually had an angle in a promo talking about the previous angle. It really is so ridiculous that Red Velvet being the one to save Cody. I mean, that was the role for Cody's wife. And I'm not saying they should have had pregnant Brandy run out there and do this. However, if it's not pregnant Brandy, it shouldn't be just a don't substitution. Do it. Yeah, why? Red Velvet? She's the one saving Cody? Ah. Unless they're going to do an angle where Cody's having an affair with Red Velvet? This, this they, was not they, the place they, for this. They won't do that. That might be interesting. It might, but they'd have to act like adults to have affairs. And Name any of the members of QT's faction, whatever the faction is. Uh, uh, some guy named Go-Go. A guy named Go-Go. And I don't know. Are you making that up? Did they actually say no, one of the guys' names? No, there's a guy was... named Go-Go. I thought you were just I making up a name. Saying, no, it, it, uh, this guy, Anthony Go-Go, I think was his name. I love that when all of a sudden there's all this chaos happening, nothing makes sense, and that's when... Excrement. Yeah, Excalibur, here, read this. Oh, and this is this man, and this is what he does. And it's just as quickly as he can tries to get out all this information about these people you don't know and don't care about. And you still don't care about him after the fact. This was just... A waste. What a waste. If you wanted to do QT, if you wanted to take a guy that the AEW fans have not... He didn't turn on it. He didn't turn on Cody. He punched Arn Anderson in the face and let his people beat up all of Cody and their friends. It did it. That the, was the turn, though. I mean, that was... He well, orchestrated know, but, the whole thing. What did help did this give to QT, who wasn't a main event star beforehand, and was per portrayed in this as that he couldn't hang in any way with Cody Rhodes when he wasn't even trying... And then he doesn't even really do anything dirty himself to instigate the whole. He punches Arn Anderson, poor fella. Arn had to take a bump for it. This him. is what happens when you alienate the other executive vice presidents and they don't want to work with you. You end up having to just work with your friends. Just Yeah, let's just bring all my And friends. your students. But anyway. Speaking of people that can't make sense out of anything, Moxley was up next. He did another promo where he actually out loud tries to make sense of the booking. And can't. No wonder he's a mental case. He's pacing around a nervous wreck at his wit's end because he can't understand the fucking booking. Uh, then he has a match with Cesar Romero, who's now the underneath preliminary heel talent, has a group and, uh, with uh, Ryan Nemeth, and there was another guy there at ringside, and I don't know. Um, at least this was babyface and heel. You could tell that, and Nemeth pulled moxley's leg and that was probably the most exciting bit of the whole fucking deal because caesar romero moves around like a sack of wet hammers he has got the most awkward body language and now that we've heard that he's been in the business for a while i'm i'm deathly afraid this is as good as he's going to get so they did a ridiculous referee distraction so that moxley could ddt nemeth and the they turn the ref around who still saw Nimeth in the ring like that's not supposed to mean something. And then Moxley choked out Caesar. So he shoehorned in both of his finishes. He got the DDT on Nimeth and then he could he, so he could do the choke out on Caesar Romero. What the Jesus Christ. I would like somebody that knew how to cut a promo to come in with some big badass like a fucking Jacob Fatu or something and promo goddamn John Moxley. And just say, you got the guts to come out here and talk about how badass you are when you are a fishy white pale boy from Cincinnati. And son, you maybe got scared when you used to watch monster movies on your 
mother's kitchen floor at night on the black and white TV when you were watching the cool ghoul on channel 19 and Frankenstein was running around. Maybe that's where you got all this violence and weirdness in your head. But this guy right here next to me is a real monster. This guy right here next to me comes from the streets of California, the Samoan gangs, places you don't want to be. He hangs out in a place where people get cut and shot on a regular basis while you're worried about losing a crap game or a street fight over in Newport. Mr. Cincinnati Kid, let me explain something to you. Jacob Fatu is the man who breaks bones, the man who crushes windpipes, the man who causes chaos. And if you're in his periphery, if you are in his presence, there's an element of danger, just like when you're in the presence of the Frankenstein monster. But when that monster wants you, when you are his single goal, that's when you really find out what it's like to feel fear down deep in the pit of your gut, John Moxley, so you can be a fishy white pale boy talking about all your accomplishments in Cincinnati. But this man, he's, he's got a criminal record and an evil disposition and malfeasance and criminal intent. And something wicked your way is going to come, John Moxley. He's going to tear his, your flesh from your bones and give you a little taste of what you always promise people. Something like that. Take the piss out of Moxley instead of everybody going, Oh, goddamn, he's so badass. Is he losing weight, too? He definitely, I said it a few weeks ago, he doesn't have as much muscle tone as he had a year ago. He looks paler and like he's lost weight so i don't know i'm pretty sure they had color tv when he was a kid so he wasn't sitting on the floor watching black and white tv but no he he was poor he lived in cincinnati my aunt lola and uncle tommy were from covington right across the river from cincinnati and they were poor and they had a black and white tv propped up on the old what color year? tv that it went out what year he had yeah, color I, tv growing up he's not from 1970 he was poor he had a black and white sitting on top of the color set that had gone out. And that's what the rabbit ears, no. that's what you use to watch the cool ghoul on channel 19. I think he's Saturday night for creature features. I think he's a little bit too young for that, but I will say, well, he, lo he looks older than his age. Another faction, like you said, another now this time, just undercard job guy faction, nothing against any of those guys. You know, Ryan Nemeth has looked good on TV, but is there any reason why these guys that keep losing matches on TV are all of a sudden together as a little unit banding nothing. together? I will say this. We just played on the drive through recently. Someone sent in slam poetry about, you know, Jim Cornette and the world of Jim Cornette. Watching Moxie's promo, I thought, you know, if someone put some of that music behind it, that's what it would sound like. <laughs> it would sound like his own little version of slam poetry. But anyway, that's all I have to say. An update from Team Taz. There's still no problems in Team Taz, except that Brian Cage obviously has a problem, and every time they say there's no problems, he gets snotty with another member of the group. And this, it, it, they don't even bother to, to, to engage in the premise that they're doing an interview about something else, and then it happens organically that Cage argues with people. They start out, no, there's no problems, and then Cage immediately argues with somebody. So it's obvious and horrible. But speaking of obvious and horrible, they d went through all of this, all of this with MJF and Jericho together and the whole inner circle drama. And then MJF trying to take over the inner circle, but being foiled, but having his own group in the background and the de laying waste to the inner circle. They went through all of that for two weeks. And it's done already. Are they, is everybody involved in this out of their rabbit ass mind? MJF and his new group that we mentioned looked great last week. And it looked like what a true top heel group should look like. And they all fit together. And boy, at least they got something going here. It lasted two weeks. It's done. It's over. They're in the locker room they stole from the inner circle. MJF opens the door, and there's the inner circle in Jericho. Opens and the door to the bathroom. Opens the door to the bathroom, and they're standing in there. Nobody in that room had taken a shit or a piss to discover that those guys were there until the cameras went on. Then he opens another door, and there's Hager, and he punches him, and basically the inner circle members come in and destroy 
I'm talking about lay waste to decimate, destroy the careers of everybody in the new group. Cash got dumped into a bathtub. Dax got hard weighed and his head busted open. They had a fight all over the backstage area that with multiple cameras all in the right place to catch everything. And I would say that it was horrible brawling, except we see in the main event tonight what hor horrible, sloppy amateur brawling really looks like. But Jericho actually stuck MJF's head in the toilet and then ran him through the Pepsi machine, poured a beer on him, and they picked his lifeless body up and tossed him out in the hall and closed the door. Thanks for fucking coming. The end. There can be no redemption. They started this. They gave the heels a week to do an interview, and then they finished it. They got no money out of it. They sold no tickets off of it. And they completely blew off every bit of, not only every bit of heat that the heels got by doing this, but they just, it, it, the and only MJF even saw what happened to it. The others were just so unimportant that, they were just left laying in a ditch somewhere after being skull-fucked and sodomized. So all that work for a one-week run of a heel group that might have actually worked. And now it's over, and it's done, and I think we can pretty much write off everybody involved as being a complete waste of time now to even try to feature on television, including... MJF, the best young heel in the business, and FTR, the best tag team in the world. So good job, Booker of the fucking year. This, if anything, I don't even like most of these fucking guys, and this got me pissed. I was hot, because this was just, this was the most egregious malpractice and misuse of, of anything, talent, angle, television time, whatever, that I've ever seen. Your thoughts. You know, I'm happy to hear you say that because I thought I was, no, I thought I was alone because I saw people what? write, I saw people write what a great beat down, what a great what? segment, and I couldn't believe it. Like you, they just put this group together. They had one match on TV as a unit with three of the guys. And one promo. All of a sudden, no one notices that the inner circle is hiding in the bathroom, standing there waiting for the door to be opened. No one noticed Jake Hager. Okay, I'll get past all of that. You immediately go to this beatdown. The baby faces, and that's what the inner circle is in this situation. Yeah. The baby faces get all their heat back. They got their revenge. <laughs> they, they get their even. revenge. M even if you want to say, oh, well, you they know. Get, they went further. They went further. MJF got the Dick Slater treatment here. Yes. Head in a toilet. He sold it. He spit up toilet water from his mouth. And then he got thrown to a Pepsi machine. These guys probably and they think... And out in the hallway like a sack of shit. These guys probably think they did something really good. And They that, do! This, that's the scary part! This was so... Again, counterproductive. That's the word of this episode. This was counterproductive. Everything Chris Jericho touches turns to fucking shit. Everything in AEW he touches since the first few months turns to complete shit. This was completely counterproductive it didn't leave me wanting to see ftr versus santana and ortiz it didn't leave me wanting to see mjf versus chris jericho and jericho get his revenge i certainly don't we, want to see anything with that. hager i certainly don't want to see anything with hager or spears well that was normal that was beforehand so <laughs> this was so ill-conceived and so counterproductive and so stupid and no one Either no one thought it was a bad idea or no one had the guts to put their foot down. That's the, I refuse to believe that everybody in that company is that stupid. And I've talked to MJF personally when in MLW, he seemed like a bright young kid and he seemed like he knew more about the business than this. He's obviously doing what he's told by people and Jericho doesn't mind because now they'll even sing his song louder, and besides that, he got to come back and get even. I just thought he would have wanted to make some money with it. You might have had a pay-per-view coming up with him and MJF if if they hadn't done this, but I think that's it. Some know, but they're scared to say anything. Because you got to, everybody can't be that stupid. Everybody involved in this cannot be this ignorant. 
about what wrestling is or should be or how it works. And speaking of ignorance of how things should work, tell me, didn't they have Twinkle Toes, Gallows, and Anderson against Penthouse Felix and Laredo Kid last week? No. What did they have? Young Bucks and Brandon Cutler. Oh, God, that's right. They just all look the same. They don't look the same. They, they all wrestle the same. Uh, I wrote, didn't they do this last week? Jump start with a flip. Before the guys are even in the ring, um, Laredo Kid flips over the top rope under the heels, and then they all jump up and stand there while Felix gets up on the top and tightrope walks the top rope and then back flips off and misses most of them. They all fell down. And I wrote, this is going to be the same hot garbage as usual, so I'll pass. It's It's tempting to watch this and pick apart every stupid thing they do, the things that don't make sense, the things they fall on their face or their ass and miss. But I was running low on time, and it's every week, so it's not even funny anymore. So I was trying to find the finish. I saw one place where one of the Mexicans tagged his partner while his partner was standing on the top rope already and reached up, oh, here, tag. And then finally, uh, Twinkle Toes won with the one-winged fairy, and Mox and the Bucks came out, and the heels ran off. I wrote, can this show please be over? But not yet. Not yet. No, we have more. Um, here's a group for you. Matt Hardy is now the leader of the Butcher, the Baker, the Bunny, Nyla Rose, and Vicky Guerrero. And Private Party. And Private Party. <clears throat> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can you honestly tell me that this is the best use of Matt Hardy with his at least name value and status that you should take three of your indiscriminate girls and four of your indiscriminate guys and make him the manager of that group when they've already They've already, they finished Nyla Rose off early. Vicky Rose has been a non-entity. The bunny, they're there. She's there because they Vicky like Guerrero. the way she looks in it. what did I say? Vicky Rose. Or Nyla Rose has been booked into oblivion. Vicky Guerrero's a non-entity. The bunny, they love the way she looks in the outfit. That's the only reason she's there. Have you seen her wrestle? I tried to, but I couldn't watch it. The butcher and the baker are fucking mid-card oblivion. And there's Matt Hardy trying to make something out of this horrible stew of chicken shit. And then they they have a girls tag match with Nyla Rose and the Bunny against Take Ty Conti and Hikaru Shida. The Dork Order comes out to be with the baby faces while Matt's got his 16 people and they jump start it and go to a break and when they come back all the guys get into a brawl around the ring. So now they're doing angles in underneath girls' matches just to make sure that none of this means anything. And there's 15 people fighting around the ring, and then Bunny used a kendo stick on Ty Conti, and once he, gimmicks in the finish even in girls' matches. This is why all this shit means nothing. What's next? Let Have a street fight between the midgets? Good God. There's a reason why this wasn't done in wrestling for 120 years, because smart people were running it. Was there, how many how many 15-person brawls have we had in the previous hour and 45 minutes now? I'm just trying to remember. It's been a few. I disagree with you. I don't think there is really much good use for Matt Hardy in 2021. It's not like he's going to elevate I, anyone I as a singles God wrestler. I MT you, I could get something. If Matt Hardy was working in my wrestling company, which he was at one point in Ring of Honor, and he had increased the business and was a pleasure to deal that with. That was a long time ago. If you want to tell me he's going to do his stupid, wacky, goofy gimmick again, there's going to be some AEW fans that still like that. Matt Hardy as Matt Hardy, there's nothing you could do with him. No one's going to care. It's like having Christian Cage versus Frankie Kazarian. It's just a guy who used to be a name, but who cares? If they'd have started at the beginning and he was Matt Hardy. Yeah, you're and, right about that. But they and he had some serious matches and got some wins and established himself as a legend that could still go, then they could have slid him partly out of the ring and put him into management and or producing 
and he might have had something to share with people, but instead this fucking Vincent Price, Beatrice Arthur gimmick bullshit and the teleportation, he's lost his fucking mind, but there's still talent there, and there's a name to be to be exploited, and if someone that was in charge, if someone was in charge, first of all, because there's nobody in charge, and secondly, if someone in charge knew what they were doing, you could get more out of him than this. I don't think you can get anything out of him. I mean, I'm not saying this is good. I'm not defending this, and you, I think you have a point where it would have been better if he didn't come in as a teleporting bozo, but I don't think there's any... I was going to say any money, in, which is funny because he's big money or whatever he is. Yeah. I don't think there's any money in Matt Hardy right now. I don't think anyone's clamoring to see Matt Hardy as Matt Hardy doing really much he's of anything. He's probably making more now than he ever has and drawing less than he ever has. Funny how these things goes. Anyway, let's get to the main event, shall we? I'm not going to do Did a Did you blow skip the Don Callis promo with the Young Bucks? Oh, it just he was talking to Pie Face. I zipped past it because I don't want to see either one of those people. Okay. Well, it was more was, Matt Jackson acting, and then he slapped I Matt know. Jackson in the face. And, yeah. That's why I didn't want to see any of that. Um, I wasn't going to watch this either, but again, there's the inner struggle within me. Do I watch this and see how stupid it is and what they fuck up so that I can make fun of them, or do I just skip over it? Of course, the arcade assholia match where the ring is surrounded by their arcade games and anything goes no dq lazy booking blue toe and pip sabian with the virgin penelope ford in their corner against chuckle fuck and pockets again more of this because it's funny because i like to play <clears throat> Penelope was dressed like she's about to join a convent of nuns, wasn't she? She's so demure, everything covered up, not showing any skin. Virtually a Quaker. Virtually a Quaker. She looks like she just got appointed to the board of directors of a massage parlor. Anyway, so should I skip it because it's garbage involving subpar talent that nobody gives a shit about? Or should I point out how preposterous, silly, and embarrassing to the profession all of this is? Everybody already knows that. Should I mention that these fucking idiots participating in this actually think it's good? Or that the amateur wannabe booking or booker that's booking this shit is proud of it? But everybody already knows that. It's a parody of pro wrestling perpetrated by people that aren't athletically talented enough or intellectually bright enough to do the real stuff the real way do it properly so they're performing a parody of it for an audience of a little less than a million people give or take weirdos that don't like pro wrestling and want to laugh at it and anybody who was ever a serious talent in the business or had any respect for it should refuse to participate in this program and or definitely in this match and i'm looking at jim ross and tony Schiavone at this point and maybe not Tony, because Tony was out of the business for 20 years. I know he's had a bunch of kids. Maybe he needs the money. If you come out and say, look, I know what I'm doing is embarrassing, but I need the money, then I could even have some sympathy there for people that are in a financial position where they need the money. I know Jim Ross doesn't need any money. He's got more money than he can spend if he starts now. The, I'm looking at the Arn Andersons. And the, well, not Jake Roberts, he's never had any integrity, but I got a Tully, who was more than happy to tell you what was wrong with you and, and how to correct it back in the day, and, and, and exists when shit like this is going on. <clears throat> it was Pip and Bluto having amateurish, bad, sloppy, brawling, taking chance on, on, getting hurt and hurting each other reckless dangerous bumps for no reason because nobody gives a shit about these people or anything they're doing because it's all phony but somebody needs to fucking stand up chris statlander came back and finally disproved my theory that everybody that comes out of a box gets over because she did and she didn't what are the odds she hurts herself again or somebody else first is what i'm wondering and as a matter of fact, right as I wondered that, she gave Penelope Ford a power slam off the apron through an air hockey table. 
that just happened to be sitting at ringside. That just happened to be made of cardboard. I mean, that well, was not but, yeah, but they're table. all gimmick, you know, and then Bluto picks up an empty or cardboard arcade game and they talk, oh my God, look at the strength. And it's obvious it's one of those Ed Wood Plan 9 from Outer Space fucking cardboard tombstones. Yeah, because when he picked it up, you could see the bottom is just a hole. There's yeah. nothing in it. Well, and he picked it, it was so easily moved, air was blowing it anyway. Um, Minivan pulls up and it's Trent. He's back and being driven by his mother who gives him a kiss on the cheek so he can go join the fight. I wrote at Great this point, timing. She's lucky she didn't hit traffic or anything Oh, yeah, else. if she'd have hit traffic down there in Florida, she could have been way late. At that point, I wrote, grown adults are doing this and trying to keep straight faces. So Pip got power slammed through a table off a stage. Um, You know, Trent's mother kissed him and he went into the fight. This right here is what you get when you take frustrated outlaw independent wrestling talent that have never been anybody in wrestling and for good reason. And you put them on national TV with no guidance and no parameters set and let them make up their own shit. This is what you get. And these jack offs think that this is good and somehow a proper representation of the sport of wrestling. And then the, of course the, the baby faces win and then, Everybody's smiling, including Trent's mother. And boy, if you didn't like what I had to say about Penelope Ford, best friends and Blue Toe and Pip, you can imagine what I'm thinking about Chuck Taylor's mother or Trent's mother, or whoever, whichever one of their mothers. They're all a bunch of mothers. And where I was going with that a minute ago is somebody ought to fucking stand up and say, you know what? If you're going to make a television show this silly and this phony and this rotten, Include me out of it. And the reason I say Jim Ross is because I think he's got the goddamn, the cachet, as they say, the power, the reputation, the respect from these people that they would at least listen to him and say, well, okay, what can we not do? And then he could say, like, most of this shit, but don't bury me. Don't make me have to go out there and call a bunch of fucking jackoffs from the Jiffy Lube doing a fucking comedy sketch of a wrestling match. Don't bury me like that. I was somebody just because I'm taking your money for your fucking upstart promotion. Doesn't mean that I've have given up all of my principles. I was an important person in this business and I will not be embarrassed this way. At least somebody could say something. I mean, th I know <clears throat> that this is a new happening that up until the past few years, you didn't have to ask when somebody wanted to book you on a show, is the invisible man going to be on the card or is anybody going to break out into a dance routine or are they fighting over something silly and being assisted by one of their mothers or whatever? It wasn't until just a few years ago. I had to ask Court Bauer. I had to ask Liverlip Lagana before the NWA thing. I had to, is the Invisible Man around? Is everybody going to be serious before I agree to take this booking? And it, it, when I went down to the, I'll give you an example. I went down to the Hall of Fame in 2017, right? 2017. And we did the thing with Kenny McIntosh. He was working for those what culture people at the time. So was James Dixon. So they rode down with me. We shot some stuff. I own that footage now. One of these days it'll be edited because they got sideways with what culture because what culture, I don't know what they were doing. And I didn't want anybody but Kenny being involved in the production of it. But anyway, I did one of the what culture events that they were running that weekend, as well as the ride down in the documentary shoot, as well as the Hall of Fame um ceremony and then one of Jim Ross's shows like it was at the House of Blues or was that Texas one of his stand up shows that's what I did that weekend so at the what culture event it was a small show there was 500 people there it was a small building but it was close to where I was staying it wasn't a goddamn wasn't meant to be a big national television taping but I get there and I'm ready to do the color and James Dixon comes to me, says, well, we've had a substitution. The name that they had booked had to pull out and then they had to scramble and get something that resembled a name to replace him. And they came up with Joey Ryan. 
And he said, I'm, I'm just, I want to tell you, cause I know you've had, you know, issues with the things he does. And I said, well, James, it's your show. I'm a visitor here. And I will, in a professional manner, call all the other matches. But if he does the dick flip, I'm going to get up and walk out. As a matter of fact, I will not call his match at all. I won't start it if he's going to do the dick flip. Just have somebody call. I got a phone call in the back. Send somebody else out to take while I go address my business. They can call his match if he's doing the dick thing. But I won't be doing it because I'm not going to fucking do it. And that's when he said, well, you know what? I think it's a bunch of fucking horse shit, too, and I don't want him to do it on the show I'm booking. So I'll just tell him, don't do it. And so I called his match because he wasn't doing the dick flip, so I honored my part. And the booker informed him not to do the dick flip because it was an afternoon show and there was kids in the audience anyway. And so what does he do? He has to do something. So he did the deal where they have the double knockout and then the fucking guy falls head first into his in incredibly strong and vulnerable dick and sells his head. And then, you know, at least you could cover that. Well, he must have a cup on. There's plenty of room in those tights. Not much else down there. Whatever. But at some point, people who are professionals who care about, who have some pride and integrity, who ever had any respect for the business, who don't need to take people's money because they have enough, need to stand up and say, no, you guys want to have this goddamn four-finger stinker clusterfuck on national television. Do not get shit all over my face. If I'm going to be on this program, act serious and be professional, or I just won't be on a fucking program. And then pick who you want. And it's easy. The other person can go home. But everybody just accepting this gives me the sour belches. Closing thoughts, Brian. That match was a disaster. The whole Trent coming back thing, it just put a period or an exclamation point on what was the overall silliness and stupidness of it. I hate that Tony Khan licensed the Pixies' Where Is My Mind for Orange Cassidy. I What now? It's a great song by a great band. That I I'm heard sure them playing what I thought was a different song. I didn't know what it was and didn't care because it was Pockets, so I didn't listen. It's a great song. It completely didn't work. I don't think it works for Orange Cassidy. Tony Khan was probably in the back. Who knows if he's high or not? But he was listening to the Pixies, and he said, you know, it would be a great idea if we got this for Orange Cassidy. Let's well, what is this it. song? Because I couldn't, I couldn't tell you this song if you held a gun to my head. What does it have to do with anything that Orange Cassidy would have to do with? Well, I guess the lyric, where is my mind? And the idea, here's this guy who has no mind. I, I really well, don't I, I mean, I, okay, I'm following that. First thing I see when I look at Pockets is this guy's fucking witless. This was garbage. There was so much on this show that wasn't good. The one match that was the best pure wrestling match was the one that was counterproductive and didn't mean anything. Let's talk about the ratings. Have you paid attention I, to I the ratings? I don't know anything about it. I've, I've been counting figures. The numbers that I've been dealing with were action figure numbers. So to put this in context, this show, which aired on, what, the 31st? Yes. Second to last NXT show on a Wednesday night. So we're one more week of the direct head-to-head -head competition, and then AEW has Wednesday nights all to themselves. Before we even talk about ratings, what do you think that means? Are they going to pick up another 200,000? I mean, where do you think yeah. the number's going to go with out NXT there? I, th I think they'll probably pick up 100, 150. I'd, they're not going to do consistently a million people, I wouldn't think, or elsewise they'd have done it by now, uh, co competition or not. They'll pick up the people that were on the fence. Uh, a lot of people that have been watching NXT just don't want to watch AEW because that I don't blame them. And there's probably some vice versa. So, but I think they'll pick up the hundred or 150, maybe 200,000 that are fence sitters and could go either way. So again, next week, the final head to head on a Wednesday night, it's also an NXT takeover night one. So it's a pretty big show for NXT. AEW announced matches. And once again, they're just announcing matches. I think once again, we get a six-man match featuring one of the people that have been in a six-man match, one of the teams from the last couple of weeks, Darby Allen against someone no one knows, follow-ups on all these things that don't make any sense. 
So this past week, the 31st, the ratings, and we could talk about what they've been for the last month since Shaq, NXT 654 and .21 in the 18 to 49 demo, which is the best they've done there in months. AEW 700,000 .26 in the demo, which I think is the smallest gap there has been between the two shows in the key advertising demo. Since Shaq, Shaq was March 3rd. That did 934,000. The next week after Shaq disappeared, so did the audience. (laughs) Went to 743,000, so almost 200,000 less viewers. So 743, then 768, then 757, all within a range. This week, 700. 700,000. There's no need to watch the program on a weekly basis because you've seen one, you've seen them all. It all looks the same. It all's uh, endless beatdowns. Every match has a jump start. Every match has an afterbirth. Every match has multiple people outside on the floor, if not multiple people in the ring. Every, every segment has an out-of-control riot and some type of heat-ridden beatdown. Every every group is mad at themselves and breaking up, and new groups form so that they can get mad at each other and break up too. Why the just repeat the notes? You can you can take then the matches look the same because they do everything they know every time they get in the ring. So what is there to watch that you haven't already seen? Well, like I said, although I believe, and it sounds like you believe, the bloom is off the rose for a while now, the question's going to be how much of an artificial bump, or I guess you shouldn't even say artificial, how much of a bump will they get now that they'll be unopposed on Wednesday night? So now you're not trying to say that they're going to all of a sudden say, oh, now we're getting a couple of hundred thousand more viewers, so the show is better and it's growing. They're not, they, they, they realize that they're getting viewers that have already been there just watching the other show i don't know what they'll say because they twist everything to fit their narrative when i said a few months ago after a show that i thought was awful that i understand why people like the matches but anyone who pretends like the formatting of the show and the booking of the show is any good is nuts that's when dave Meltzer went at me on twitter (laughs) and said how could you say that after this week's episode you need to pick your spots and you know you start seeing the other things he was booker of the year this and that Hey, listen, I talked about it last week on the drive-thru. AEW does a fantastic job, maybe the best job of any promotion ever, of converting a large portion of their audience, in this case, which, what, an eighth? Sometimes even better than that, into paying customers four times a year for $50 For the pay-per-views, yeah. Fantastic job. But actually, hold on here a second, because if you apply the logic of Traditional pro wrestling, every territory that was dying was on its ass. The people that were left were the people that had been there from the start, the people that weren't going to not watch wrestling, the people that are going to watch every wrestling they possibly can, and they were the ones that were going to buy every ticket and et cetera. When you have, it's not fair to say, when the WWF had 10 million people watching on Monday nights, that they didn't convert over a million to buy their pay-per-views. It's not fair. It's not the same thing. You have the most devoted, die-hard, willing to live and die over this shit, and for some reason they like it. Small niche audience already watching the program, so you're naturally going to convert a much higher percentage of that number to buy the pay-per-view than if you had a legitimate large audience of 5 or 10 million people and a lot of them would not be as as dedicated. It's still not easy. TNA is n- was never able to do that, even at any of their good points. They were never well, able no, to convert that's a large They never portion. tried to sell anything, because Shitstain's whole thing was do everything on television, and the p- pay-per-views were mostly meaningless. So that was... Here, here's the thing about Best Booker, and again, I point out that this show is booked horribly and the formatting sucks, and not only do I stick with that, I double well, down we on that. Well, po- we not only say that, but we point out why and give specific examples that everybody can see. So I don't know why this is in question, but what we're talking here's about. Here's my question for you. Let's take the last pay-per-view, for example. What did it do, 150,000 
buy somewhere in that range. I'll, I'll take your word. All those matches, Moxley, Omega, barbed wire explosion match, Young Bucks versus, I don't even remember who they wrestled, to be quite honest, off the top of my yeah, head. It's all the same. All those matches, every match on the show, whatever match you want to look at, the uh, alley fight with Sting and Darby. I don't think the week-to-week booking helps any of those matches. I think the people who buy those pay-per-view events are like, wow, I really want to see this match. I want to see what's going to happen in this match. I want to see the Young Bucks do their thing. I want to see the exploding ring. I want to see the matches. I don't think there's anything in the booking. You know, I really didn't want to see that match, but they did this great angle on TV. I'll go further. I think that people, when the matches are first announced, want to see them more than they actually do when the matches come about after they've seen the build. I think that makes you want to see those matches less because they've already given you everything you can... If the heel has gotten heat, the babyface always gets tons of revenge before you have to pay to see it, or vice versa. It, 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 there's yeah, what, no, are they gonna, what are they going to do with the inner circle and pinnacle? War games? What are you going to do now? Why would anyone well, no, want to see it? You're, they're not going to have a match now. Yes, they, they can't will. have a match now. Yes, they what? will. What? Yes, what? they will. <laughs> it's done. It's over. There's no reason to have the match now. That's why I'm saying but you did all this for two weeks, didn't even get a fucking pay-per-view out of it. It's done. No way. I guarantee it. It should be based on, I mean, this is the angle you do at the end. I guarantee there will be matches. They may even do, it's five on five. They may even do war games with this one because they've been wanting to do that for a while. They were waiting to have their fans back. And of course, that was when Cody and the uh, the elite were still on the same page uh-huh. when they tried to do that. But no, they're going to still try to do it. They're still going to try to have a match where Jericho gets the revenge on MJF that he didn't get by giving him a swirly and throwing him when's through the their, When's their next machine? pay-per-view? I don't even know. I'm not sure. Well, it, it, I assume it's more than a month away because they just had one recently. Yeah, I would so think so, they, yeah. They actually thought that it was a good idea. As, as You know what this reminds me of? I'll say this, we're going to close it up. As it reminds me of after Kane initially debuted a hell in a cell and fucking dropped Undertaker on his head, Shit Stain wanted Undertaker to choke slam Kane through the announce desk the following week on Raw. And that was October. And they weren't going to have a match until March at WrestleMania. And that's when I had to look at Vince McMahon. I said, how the fuck do you think we're going to keep them apart for six months if they're already choke slamming people to each other through the fucking announce desk the week after the debut? And that's when Vince McMahon had to turn to Russo and go, just calm, basically, in, a, in Vince's way, calm down, son. The grown folks are talking, and we're going to take this slow. Uh, Next pay-per-view is May 30th, double or nothing. Okay, then that's almost two. They had two months that they could have let the pinnacle ride that heat, and they could have had Inner Circle come back and try to get even, but be foiled at every opportunity and put a little more heat on it and then do their goddamn war games at the pay-per-view and it would have made sense. And then you could flush MJF's head down the toilet. But what they've done now is they've just, they've started a story and they've finished it. And now they've got another 16 chapters of their murder mystery. When everybody already knows who did it. And the guy's been caught and sent to prison. How are they going to fill the rest of the book? Fucking morons. Anyway, closing thoughts, Brian quickly. We'll be back on the drive through with more fun on Tuesday. More fun. That's right. And we're going to watch the, the NXT show that's on, at least the one that's on television next week. And we'll be talking about that. And, of course, WrestleMania is not too far away. But uh, And our drive through will be on the normal day this week. We're recording it early so that I can still be on the air and, and attend to Stacy's surgery at the same time. So those are our program updates. And if you ordered anything from me, bless you. Give me plenty of time. Nobody needs to get jumpy. Uh, until the, <laughs> what? until then, no need to get jumpy. Where's my figure? I need my action figure. Hey, I'm telling you, th- these things happen. <laughs> I've already had people ask me for tracking numbers on shit they ordered five days ago. I haven't even opened the box yet. Uh, But anyway, having said that, we'll be back on the drive-thru and next week on The Experience for the great Brian Last or the last Brian Great. I'm Jim Cornette. 
all wrestling sucks anymore, and we'll tell you more about it in detail next week. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.